we finally made it to the last video of our discussion, and for this I want to give a bit of a preamble and context, because this video is a bit different than the previous two, and I want to be charitable and fair to the people where I think it's due. The Lily Orchard video is now over four years old, and she has actually released multiple rewrites of different parts of her video over the years that she thought she didn't address properly in the initial video. She also left a pinned comment on her video seven months ago stating that they no longer stand by the racism segment of their video and overreached in some of their wording. Because of that, I think this shows some reflection and growth, so I want to reiterate, this will merely be an analysis of that video and not by any means an indictment of her character as a whole, even if in tone matching her with my response I might be a little rude at times. Why still respond then, you might wonder? Well, a defense of Steven Universe without addressing the single biggest thing that changed its discourse on the internet forever, a video that is still publicly gaining thousands of views as we speak, well, it'd be like trying to cover the history of World War II but leaving out Pearl Harbor, the atomic bombs, and anything to do with Germany. The Lily Orchard video, at time of recording, has 8.5 million views. In fact, it's one of the highest numbers I've ever seen on any video critiquing any media whatsoever on YouTube. And I do think the video is blood-boilingly terrible, but it also managed to do something that seems so sinister, although I won't accuse it of being on purpose. From the last few hours of this video, you have seen how the other large videos against Steven Universe were almost unilaterally small nitpicks with the actual show, and more so vehicles to attack Steven Universe on grounds of perceived progressivism. Any person who worked on the show being dehumanized and harassed relentlessly for anything resembling a left-leaning opinion on human rights, or even just for happening to be black or a minority. There were slurs based on sexuality, gender identity, and ability as a whole levied constantly, as well as insults given to physical character. There were people called pedophiles for acknowledging the inarguable distinction between gender and sex. Accusations of grooming indoctrinators for daring to put something analogous to gay people in a show. Equating this to North Korean propaganda. The people who made these videos came at it hard. But when I look through the hate and at their criticisms, much of them apply equally or much more so to otherwise beloved shows that didn't get the same attention. Adventure Time, even Avatar. The single distinguishing thing with Steven Universe was its willingness to broach and tackle more broad-spanning queer themes in ways that strictly didn't alienate non-queer people. Not to say it did it perfectly, but it tried, and that's a noble attempt. Steven Universe even became the first Western cartoon to feature a same-sex wedding. I mean, sure, gyms are all same-sex, technically, since they don't have sex, but regardless, the show intentionally toyed with the gender coding, like giving Sapphire, the more feminine-presenting one, a suit, and Ruby, the more masculine one, a dress, to further drive home the ambiguity of self-representation and advocacy, of personal expression. The harassment campaign that started at this point should be obvious to everyone was one targeted for the sole purpose of crushing one of the few cartoons to ever lean this far to help normalize otherwise marginalized identities of people. The Lily Orchard video came in after the wave was already rolling. The discourse and hate was already starting to turn against Steven Universe, and that's when the Lily video dropped. As a left-leaning person of marginalized identity herself, did she defend Steven Universe against the obvious bad faith, unironically everything phobic harassment campaign? No. Her video joined in, and using the visage of left wing activism further crushed Steven Universe under its boot. No show is without criticism, of course, but we all selectively choose what to advocate for based on what we think is important to us personally. If there are two big arguments pushing for change, one is the leopards eating your face party, and the other is the no leopards should eat people's faces party. And you think most people shouldn't have their faces eaten, but like maybe some people should? Then it would be ridiculous to vocalize this small disagreement and team up with the people advocating that all people get their faces eaten. There is a wonderful video by Sean on Posey Parker that demonstrates this as her own place in taking over the TERF movement. Despite TERFs claiming to be feminists, they have gone so anti-trans that they're now willing to stand by confirmed and unabashed white supremacists and neo-Nazis. These people, I hope I don't need to tell you, don't support any of the other rights that are important to women's equality. 
the right to abortion in any form, the right to vote, the rights granted in no-fault divorce, and even laws that outlaw marital sexual abuse. These so-called feminists take up arms with people who want to bring back their subjugation actively hundreds of years, simply in the pursuit of hating trans people and ensuring that they don't get to live in a free society. This is what happens when small disagreements lead you to side with people who otherwise would be your enemies. And this is why the Lily video is so frustrating to me. As a person wanting to make the world a better place, you can choose to place your efforts towards an infinite number of things. Why assist people in their bad faith attempts to exterminate good things, even if those good things aren't perfect? Because of exaggerated and largely nitpicky grievances? The video, placing itself as a leftist critique while riding and further multiplying the wave of people as far right as they come, created to crush one of the only shows willing to stand up for marginalized voices at the time, it's sinister. It also, despite being a video with 8.5 million views, has less comments than my Pikmin 2 video. And this is because nearly every comment rightfully calling out and defending Steven Universe was deleted until she reopened comments more freely again recently. So anyone who disagrees with Lily and goes to the comments and see if other people maybe have similar grievances will be greeted by people lavishing her with infinite praise. That being said, I've ranted long enough. I'm going to be skipping over many parts that Lily no longer stands by, as well as arguments that we already covered in the previous two videos in order to not be redundant. Let's begin. In reality, Steven Universe turned out to be a mess of inconsistent storytelling, mashed up cliches that haven't been allowed to die, and a conga line of characters so consistently horrible that it's like being around all of your worst family members for the longest Thanksgiving ever. Steven Universe enjoyed ample praise and lavishings from the general press when it first aired, but as time went on, its fan base became significantly more critical and unhappy with the show's contents, to the point that being critical of the show was an entire subculture of its own, and that is not undeserved. Everything about the show is unprofessional and lazy, from its writing to the animation to the very core ideas the series pretends to have. This is a thorough deconstruction of why Steven Universe is a garbage show, that is bad. I hate the prevailing attitude that serialization is objectively superior to episodic storytelling in every possible scenario. Like any other narrative tool, serialization works very well when it's appropriate to the story. It's very easy to just say that shows with a continuous overarching plot are always better than a monster of the week, but that's just flat out not true and it's most evident in shows that try to have it both ways. But regardless of what narrative tool you decide to use for your show, you do have to pick one. You do have to pick one. The first point is that serialization is not necessarily better than an episodic structure, and then that you have to pick one or the other, it doesn't typically work when you do both. I want to remind that I can't speak to any of Lily's current opinions, this is just responding to the video, but this is a ridiculous opinion to have. Basically, every major show in animation has been some mix of serialization and episodic. Adventure Time is obviously a huge example of that, but even if we go to, like, anime and look at some of the most famous anime of all time, Neon Genesis Evangelion is mostly a Monster of the Week episodic show until, like, episode 15, only with some world-building and characterization stuff that builds up until the breaking point. Same deal with Cardcaptor Sakura. Literally the first half of the show is mostly episodic, and then suddenly it starts hitting a plot arc. It's outrageously common to see shows balance serialization and episodic structure, especially whenever it's a world-building show that often deals with mystery, which is exactly what Steven Universe is. It seems weird that she would say, you need to pick one, when it's apparent to anyone who's seen more than a few shows that that's not true. Steven Universe has this long, overarching plot about the Crystal Gem War and Homeworld discovering they're still active and f***ing with their plans. But what was consistently aggravating is that Sugar clearly wanted to maintain a Monster of the Week vibe on top of that and focus on more character-specific elements like The Last Airbender did. Let's have seven different episodes about why Lars is an unbelievable douche. Let's do three about Ronaldo being a conspiracy theorist. Let's do some about Mayor Dewey for some f***ing reason. Ooh, I know, how about that one family that runs a pizza shop? I bet their lives are totally f***ing interesting. Lars ends up having a very plot-important character arc that spans the entire series. And if they're trying to make a mystery show where you're trying to figure out the background of things, it's good to get the greater picture and set intentional red herrings into the plot. You don't want to just have things that are only important to the actual answers because then it's easier to put all the pieces together early on. Intergalactic fascism with a smattering of natural rule? <laughs> Boring. Let's talk about the wrestling scene. That's where the real action's at. You see, the side stories in The Last Airbender were so good because they offered insight into a primary character. The Southern Raiders was about Katara getting revenge on the man that killed her mother. Zuko alone was about witnessing firsthand the damage that his father's warmongering has been causing on the Earth Kingdom. You know what The Last Airbender didn't have? An entire character arc for the cabbage guy. But The Last Airbender is a full Fully serialized show. The only episodic element is generally a new problem or issue or plot thread will be introduced and solved within the same episode, but it still follows a very consistent overarching serialized
this journey with constant changes. But look at another show similar, like Teen Titans that was coming out at the same time, and it actually has multiple episodic things that you can easily jump into the same way you can with Steven Universe, while also balancing that general overarching plot with little chunks of plot-relevant episodes. Avatar The Last Airbender is just a fundamentally bad example because the structure of the show and what they're going for is completely different. Steven Universe is doing, the residents of Beach City aren't active players in the thin veneer of a story that Steven Universe pretends to have. They're background characters, they're weirdly misshapen, constantly shrinking Libras. They don't get proper character arcs because they show up, deal with the crisis of the day, and then go sit in the green room until Sugar wants to stall for time again. Literally the only one who does change is Lars, and that's because Sugar literally fucking killed him and replaced him with another character entirely. As somebody who had no experience with the community and just binged the whole show on HBO, Lars' character arc makes sense, absolutely. It's the absolute failure in his willingness to let Sadie die on the ship being taken back by Aquamarine. After that happens, he completely is beating himself up and feels terrible. He finally has that growth moment where he wants to do something to be a better person. And what does he do whenever he finally decides to be a better person? He gets killed for it. So he actually makes the change in his character before he dies. But once he is revived, it's sort of like, He's given a second wind. He finally got to do what he'd never had the bravery to do. He saved someone. People care about him. He got the thing that he's been established to want more than anything, and all he had to do was be brave and be himself. It's actually a very coherent arc. It's not like they replaced him with someone randomly. Also, Sadie grows a ton as a character. Going from a worker who's taken advantage of often, to someone who pursues their creative and artistic passions, to someone who embraces their more masculine attributes, and decides to let her opinions be heard through her band. This is an extremely gradual and seamless progression of Sadie's character arc that makes perfect sense by the end whenever she and her band are playing whenever they arrive at the end of season five. Normally filler is fine to flesh out the world and the other characters, but the world being fleshed out is Earth, which doesn't need fleshing out. I mean, it's still a fantasy story in a fantasy place on Earth. It's not like they're trying to tell us about how insects work. They're telling us about individual people, characters that don't exist in reality. So actually, yes, you do need world building to establish things that are on Earth, because world building isn't just magical fantasy races and gems, especially whenever Earth actually has some of the gem stuff on it. And the specific cohabitation between these two species, the gems and the humans, is one of the most important factors thematically in Steven being half gem and half human. This push and pull between the gem side and the human side is something that's important to the story. Am I going to defend every Ronaldo episode? No. In fact, Onion Gang in season four, I think, is an absolutely terrible episode. It's terrible. I hate it. It's awful. I, I, it's such a bad episode. But aside from that, most of the episodes aren't filler because unless you know that they aren't going to be important from the get-go, they are something that could possibly turn into something interesting if you're looking at it as a mystery show, which is exactly how the show structures itself with different twists and reveals. Episodes of shows are usually the fun, light-hearted episodes the writers use to ease off the tension of the main story, if they have one. Steven Universe doesn't have that need for easing tension, as the filler episodes outnumber the story episodes considerably. See, like, this episode is a major thing for Sadie's character arc, because she was the one who was supposed to come on stage and do this, but she felt embarrassed because it was too feminine for the type of person that she was. Because Steven feels bad for what he did in accidentally setting her up to do this thing that doesn't fit who she truly is, he goes on stage and does it for her. And it ends up being quite smart, because it actually plays on the gender bias of the audience who might think it's weird or uncomfortable for Steven to be doing this, and then it makes you internalize those feelings as something Sadie felt in not wanting to do it. So if this is an example that Lily is throwing on screen as she says this, it's going directly counter to her point. It almost feels like Sugar wanted to have a story about an intergalactic space war, but also wanted to just write fanfics about random people in Beach City and couldn't seem to pick one. And for a while that worked for her. The fandom at the very least- Oh, this is Onion Gang. This episode is so bad. This, this is the one I was talking about. There we go. This is a good example of a filler episode. I'm sorry, Onion Gang likers. Uh, this, I, I, I ain't feeling that. I ain't feeling Onion Gang. I, I'm, I'm a hater. I'm a hater of Onion Gang. <laughs> seem to love all of this, and Steven Universe Circus Season 1 had an extremely critically undiscerning fanbase. But everything changed when the hiatus is attacked. So the vast majority of people who will ever experience Steven Universe from now until the end of time are going to experience it the same way I did, which was just by binging it on some streaming service or buying, like, DVDs, Blu-rays, and watching it that way. Because of that, I'm going to be skipping over a lot of the hiatus criticisms, because quite frankly, even though those complaints and issues I'm sure were valid and I'm sorry that those people had to go through that, it doesn't actually affect the quality of the show in and of itself. It only affects the perception and the bias that people have when going into the show. And once again, as someone who didn't ever have to wait for these biases and just binge the show basically in one go, I couldn't tell you the difference between Steven Bombs pretty much at all. And by pretty much at all, I mean I, I actually literally have no idea. There's season changes, and like from season one to season two, it seems like there's an upgrade in the production quality, but that's basically the only thing I could tell. I repeat, 
it will soon destroy the entire fucking planet. Now, in any other show, this kind of story would have a sense of urgency about it. Not in Steven Universe, however. The episodes Back to the Barn, Too Far, The Answer, Steven's Birthday, Message Received, and Log Date 7152 barely have anything to do with the actual story. They spend most of the time chilling and not really doing much. It's only Back to the Barn that in any way advances the story itself, and there's no reason why the other three couldn't have waited until after the cluster had been stopped. Too Far takes place while they're trying to work on the drill, and specifically as a character building thing for Peridot, which is extremely important considering she just recently started to fit in with the group. The answer also isn't passing any major time during the drill arc, it's mainly a flashback that explains the fusion of Ruby and Sapphire, which is an amazing episode. Steven's birthday is very important for him developing new powers, and also has to deal with his own self-consciousness and trying to understand growing up. So really what you're getting is resolution to a lot of general character arcs and setup for future character arcs leading up to a large plot event. Considering the conclusion of Jim Drill as well, it's important they set up Steven's growth and birthday as how much he's changed from the start of the show and how his perspective is being adjusted. Message Received is a huge plot-relevant thing. Considering the cluster isn't the climax of the series, it's very important to have this interaction between Yellow Diamond and Peridot because it sort of cements her place in the crew, as well as setting up things for beyond the cluster arc. Log Date is also a more flashbacky type of thing that leads to better understanding Peridot in context. And Super Watermelon Island basically concludes the whole thing as they find where Jasper and Lapis's fusion has been and are able to finally put a resolution to that plot that ended up being set up at the end of Season 1. So, Ending previous plot resolutions, starting new plot resolutions, ending character arcs, starting new character arcs, it's all setting up through the growth of the Jim Drill arc. Stating these episodes that are extremely critical to character growth or just flat out plot reasons as filler is really goobery. It doesn't make any sense. If you take the episode that make up the cluster arc and rearrange them so the waffling happens after the cluster has been bubbled... No, if you put all of these after the cluster arc plot-wise has already been concluded, a lot of the different plot beats in these episodes get screwed up. Now, that's okay, let's say you rewrite a lot of these episodes. Even then, you don't have the proper character arc and setup for Paradox completely flipping sides and deciding to help the gems with the crystal. I mean, message received, at least, is extremely important to the gem drill arc from a plot perspective. And understanding how Steven has grown from Steven's birthday and his ability to communicate with the cluster is also important. So, like, this is a far worse structuring that completely ignores the character development and structuring. Nearly every arc has this issue, the Jasper arc from Gemhunt to Earthling. So this only works if you view this as purely a plot arc, but it isn't. It's a arc of Jasper's character. So you've got two things with Jasper's character, and then uh, events in between, and the resolution of Jasper's character arc. The stuff with Steven and Amethyst is something that's been building for a couple seasons at this point, and is finally coming to a head as she slowly realizes that she's becoming the weakest link in the group. Bismuth is a super plot relevant episode just in general, and considering Earthlings happens after the last episode, of the supposed Jasper arc, that shouldn't even come into consideration if you're only worrying about the pacing of the Jasper arc. So, this is, this is goobery. In the middle of it. The homeworld arc has- Okay, this one's pretty bad. Dewey wins. Now, I can understand after multiple huge emotional episodes that they would want to chill out for just a little bit, but Dewey wins is- <laughs> that is a really bad placement, I will admit. Back to the Kindergarten, though, is extremely important, and Sadie Killer is also important, considering it's going to be setting up the overall resolution between Lars and Sadie, Lars at this point being set up as a major narratively important character, and the specific relationship between Sadie and Lars being an important throughline through the show. Jim Cajun is also important to show how Steven is actually dealing with the situation, because after everything that we've seen, it's important for us to get an understanding of where he is mentally. So Jim Cajun is actually very plot relevant in terms of understanding literally the main character's headspace after one of the biggest things in the series happened. And Kevin Party is literally the resolution of the Jim Cajun thing. So this is a repeating issue with the last two characterizations Lily has made. She's only looking at Steven Universe in terms of how the plot connects to specifically dealing with the diamonds, but that's not what Steven Universe is, it's a character-focused show with multiple character arcs constantly intertwining between it, and this is a common, normal, and good thing that multiple shows do. So what you have here is Jim Cation and Kevin Party are part of the same character arc, Sadie Killer gives us more of an insight into what she's doing, what she's going through, etc., in between the two major Lars plot points. Yeah, just... All of this avoids the fact that you actually have characters you have to write in the show. 
wins Jim Cation and Kevin party wedged inside it. And the pink diamond arc that What your problem is plot relevant in the sense that it's set up as the search for Ruby from Steven and Amethyst. So it's actually continuing off the plot relevant thing that happens in the previous episode. But there's a point that's a really good lesson for kids that's not to worry too much about others that you stop caring about and taking care of yourself. Which is, once again, Steven Universe is a show for kids. This is a simple, important, good message that services both as an episodic thing that also links into the main plot. Considering this filler is unquestionably ridiculous. The question is literally the resolution to Ruby's entire character arc on what she decides that she's going to do. And so, like, what? How can you count now we're only falling apart as plot relevant, but not count the question? See, she's considering it the pink diamond arc, but then ignoring the largest character arc Garnet goes through in the entire show, and counting anything involving that that doesn't specifically link to pink diamond as filler. What? Would you call the marriage between Ruby and Sapphire, them falling apart, Ruby running away, trying to find her new identity, all of these which are multi-episode entire thi I mean, look, there's even part one and part two. You're telling me that there's a filler episode based around one of the main characters of the show and one of the most major decisions in the show, and it's filler because, you know, they're not fighting the diamonds in this episode. This portrays a fundamental lack of understanding in how to write a show and what kind of show that Steven Universe is even trying to be. It's like if you put a round peg inside of a square hole, saw the opening spots and went, what the heck's with all this extra space here? What is that for? Instead of realizing, oh, that's not the one that's supposed to go inside there. The way they're viewing it is as if the entire purpose of Steven Universe was only to fight the diamonds from the beginning and anything involving any sort of character growth, character relationships, or general lessons that would be beneficial for kids is completely irrelevant, which is ignoring basically everything about the show in order to make a point. Five episodes jam between it before anything remotely resembling a conclusion starts to inch its way forward. The biggest contributor to this constant starting and stopping is the fact that Steven Universe plays out like any other cartoon. But unlike any other cartoon, it's lashed to Steven himself at all times. So while in theory, the plot tends to play out at a relatively realistic pace, all the important and interesting things are happening completely off screen. Why there are so many episodes where Steven is hanging out with some other gem only for the plot to come bursting through the wall, or a character's personal issues just jump right out of the blue. I need to stress that this is unusual for any TV show. TV shows are typically written in a full third person perspective so that the focus can shift for a bit when necessary. You know, I actually think that this explains why Lily has such an issue with the show. She literally just doesn't realize that Steven Universe is not meant to be a fully serialized show. She told Rebecca that she had to choose one at the beginning for basically completely arbitrary and unjustified reasons, and now is intentionally only viewing the show as if it were purely serialized and criticizing anything that doesn't fit the serialization. But even then, she's not actually matching the real serialization of, like, character arcs and things. It's only a very specific plot plot thread that she found personal interest in that she's viewing the entire lens of the show from, instead of viewing it as a bunch of different characters and lessons and thematic points. The reason why things latch on to Steven and don't switch between characters constantly would be pretty obvious to anyone who's watched the show in recent time. Whenever you don't know what's going to happen in Steven Universe and you're watching, one of the most major things is the world building, trying to figure out what's going on. And just in case you didn't know, if you switch to the diamonds like five episodes into season one, it would like ruin major aspects of the story because the whole pacing and structure would be completely thrown out of whack and a lot of the things that show intrigue would be completely wasted. What Lily's doing here is starting a slasher movie and being angry that the movie hasn't already revealed who the murderer is five minutes into the movie. What she's doing here is reading a Sherlock Holmes book and wondering why the book hasn't told the reader who the actual criminal is at the very beginning. It's fine if spoilers don't change how you feel about a show, but in specifically mystery narratives, a lot of the enjoyment comes from trying to understand what is actually happening in the story and seeing all the tiny little clues that are being laid along the path. When I went into Steven Universe completely blind, and I thought to myself, wait, is Garnet a fusion? She has two gems. I was jaw dropped and literally amazed whenever it turned out that she was a fusion. I was so unbelievably proud of myself and found investment in joining the show even more so than if there was an episode in season one where Garnet talks to herself and is like, oh, I want to sell Steven, but I can't. It's much better to wait until Steven finds out on his own and then she explained the difference. It's like Lily can only conceive of a singular story that could be good. Any other genre that doesn't fit that mold isn't just a different genre, it's actually a worse written story, which doesn't make sense. 
more insight into the diamonds as a whole if the show could just bother to tear itself away from Steven for even a second. Even if- Like, imagine that. Imagine if they had an episode, like in season one, when Steven can barely use any of his powers and has barely discovered anything about his mom, and then bam, they cut away and, where's Pink Diamond? Oh, she- she disappeared whenever Pink- whenever Rose Quartz killed her, but su suspiciously, it was at the same time. And then they give, like, a whole explanation of the gem war, and, like, we don't even know about Homeworld whatsoever at this point. Like, obviously you need sufficient structure, but also, if you're going to structure a story that's based around characters who don't understand the full context of something, giving the reader of the story context whenever the characters that they're following don't have the context becomes infuriating because it feels like they're dragging their feet even more. The reader thinks to themselves, I, I know what's going on, why don't they just figure it out already? And so, you end up waiting for them to catch up to you, rather than you following along and wondering with the characters. It also separates you from the emotional state of the characters. I don't- there's like- I don't know, you could probably write like a 10,000 word thesis. You could, there's probably been multiple books written on the intention of writing a story with mystery. Uh, it's just, it's such a fundamentally broken point to make that it's hard to even, it's hard to even characterize how ridiculous it is episodes that technically don't feature Steven are either a story being told to him or feature a fusion that Steven inhabits. With this arbitrary restriction in place, a lot of interesting things happen completely off screen, which in terms of storytelling means it doesn't actually happen. It's only an arbitrary restriction in the same way that every other creative decision is an arbitrary restriction. There's nothing actually tangibly bad about the decision, and literally millions of other shows and pieces of art do it. If you aren't a fan of that, that's fine, but the way you're using it, you're using objective language in how you're criticizing the show, not subjective language, and from an objective standpoint, you're wrong here. Steven Universe has so many characters that just sit there and do nothing because Steven isn't around to see them. Lapis and Peridot are the two biggest examples as they're locked in the barn at all times until Steven decides to visit them, at which point something actually happens. Pearl might not have been such a crazy asshole. Garnet might not have been relegated to exposition about fusion and nothing else. How can you say that Garnet is relegated to fusion and nothing else when she has a five episode arc in season five explicitly about the fusion of Ruby and Sapphire, who they are as people and finding themselves, that you dismissed as filler just a few minutes ago? How can you possibly say with any level of confidence that she's reduced to only exposition about fusion when you literally showed five episodes where it's explicitly about the character development and growth and not fusion of Garnet and you called it filler. Also, like, Keystone Motel is one of the most iconic episodes of the show and that also isn't just about fusion, at least not as a stand-in for the relationship that Ruby and Sapphire have. Instead, it offers hints. It gives hints that Lapis might have PTSD. It gives hints that Peridot might have self-worth issues. It gives hints of character development. This isn't good writing, it's lazy writing. The sad thing is it's lazy writing that works. Steven Universe is providing little more than a collection of writing prompts and being heralded as an amazing and deep show just because a bunch of far more creative people can write 50 pages based off those prompts. The big twist of the show is that Rose is Pink Diamond, but that twist was guessed by the fandom the moment Pink Diamond's name was first mentioned. Not only does Steven Universe rely on the fans to imagine a better show in its place, it actively mocks them for doing so. In the episode Lion 4 alternate ending, Steven spends an episode deconstructing Rose's tape and trying to find the answer to his purpose in life. This has been a common trend for fandom theory since the start of the show. Namely, why did Rose give herself up to bring Steven into the world? Steven investigates as much as he can and finds a tape for Nora and spends the rest of the episode trying to discover who Nora is. Nora is just what Steven's name would have been if he was a girl. And the only reason he exists at all is just because Rose wanted a baby. Now you might be asking yourself, why did this need to be an entire episode that teased the viewer with something interesting only to yank it out from under them at the last minute? Because fuck you, that's why. This episode's only defense for existing is we need to remind people that they're special just the way they are. I feel like Rose wanting to bring a baby into the world is specifically compelling because it not only reinforces the selfishness that we come to understand of Rose, but also reinforces the love that she ended up having for humankind, showing that she was literally willing to let herself die and be reborn as a partial human. In other words, showing that she truly did see the humans as equal to the gems. There's obviously a lot of things you could speculate about Rose's intentions, but she was against Homeworld, and she knew that Homeworld, out of basically rule of thumb, would completely dismiss anything a human said, and also value her opinion to some extent no matter what she did. Her mixing is an absolute statement of defiance that's so extreme that White Diamond can't even conceive that it's possible. But that statement of defiance is also an extreme measure that ends up allowing White Diamond to see the difference. I don't know, I think that that's pretty poetic. And not at all a cheap answer to the question. Rose wanted to have a baby. Why is that not naturally significant whenever she's a completely different species that was originally set to subjugate and exterminate the entire race of them because they weren't even seen as conscious beings? Her giving her life to cohabit with that species, not as changing her identity like she did, but literally giving up her life to give birth to Steven, a unique half-gem, half-human individual, the first of his kind. I don't know. I don't know. I... I think that's pretty compelling, actually. I think that's a very unique, interesting, and original plot beat. I think 
that for the sake of itself is poetic and cute and yeah actually the lesson about your special whatever way blah blah, blah that she makes fun of here uh this is a show for eight to twelve year olds Yes, <laughs> that is a good lesson to teach kids, actually. It's not a silly, oh, we've heard this before. Well, yeah, maybe you have because you're like 85 years old. Not the eight-year-olds who are watching this television who might be bullied at school or have abusive family members. This could be something that really emotionally resonates with them at this exact important part in their lives who actually needs to be reminded of that is going to need more solid ground than Steven Universe to tell them. This is the closest thing to a solid theme that Steven Universe even has. With the exception of characters that already have their shit together, almost every character arc is about learning to love yourself. But not loving yourself Ooh, in a practical true. way, where you have aspirations and goals and work toward them while taking part in self-improvement and making sure you're a healthy and functional person. You know, what loving yourself actually means. We mean the internet version of loving yourself, where you're complacent, never put in any effort to solve your problems, mope until somebody coddles you and pretend you don't have problems in the first place, and give up the moment you're confronted with failure because acknowledging that you have things to work on isn't comfortable. You're already as good as you're ever going to be. That's not true. Steven is actively trying to improve himself constantly throughout the story, and yeah, they do make him feel better whenever he feels bad about not succeeding, but he doesn't stop trying to improve himself either. I mean, that's basically the entire first arc of his character in Season 1, is just him trying to prove himself to the gyms as being reliable through being able to succeed in certain things. And yeah, he fails multiple times, but he gets a little bit better until eventually he becomes fairly competent. Look at that one episode where they're trapped in the pyramid, and like, he almost kills them, and he's like a complete idiot that's like, I don't know, in the first 10 episodes or something, he's a completely different person than the Steven in later seasons. Says the diamond, I mean Rebecca Sugar. Also, I don't remember everything about the show, but saying Rebecca Sugar is a diamond whenever later you're going to be calling the diamonds Nazis is very insensitive. Works hard, and by the end of her effective character arc, she's able to fend off a fusion alone while Steven has another sulking fit. She's the most emotionally stable among the cast, which I know isn't a high bar clear in the first place, but bear with me here, and frequently pulls everyone else out of danger. Bismuth was another character who aspired to be more than she was, so much so she longed to take that aspiration to homeworld and liberate everyone. And for her initiative, she was labeled just as bad as the diamonds by the show, a genocidal killer by the fandom, and then bubbled in what is still the most horrific act of intellectual carelessness by Sugar. Bismuth was bubbled because she tried to kill Steven and wouldn't listen to him. If Steven didn't bubble her, he would have died. She definitely wasn't seen as just as evil as the Diamonds because they ended up bringing her back and trying to clear the misunderstanding and then eventually she did agree and she did help them. I do understand that no matter what level of political advocacy is a little bit cringe of a lesson, but this is a show for 8 to 12 year olds, and yeah, maybe we shouldn't reinforce ideas of violence fixes our problems. It's kind of a obvious not good thing to teach kids, I don't know. The nuances of when maybe it actually is acceptable is more of an adult topic anyways. It's because the show just doesn't have any f writers. The show is entirely written by the storyboard team who are prioritizing jokes and set pieces above everything else and trying to make the story bend around that. In the interviews and official concept books that have come out since, there's actually a lot of details that were specifically laid out beforehand, and just because the storyboard artists are also writers doesn't actually make a difference, because they are both people with talents as writers and storyboard artists. They're still writing the episodes, they're just also the ones doing the art for the episodes. If anything, there's even more creative control than you would see on a typical series. I'm not sure where they're getting the information, but if they're also getting the information the same place that ER got his, then once again, Lily's getting their information from, like, some not great sources. Most of the time, character development doesn't happen. Then it comes in trickles, and then an epiphany just rushes in at the last possible second of a dragged out story arc. This means there isn't really much to say about each character on their own. So I'm very skeptical about her claim of character progression, considering she already considered multiple obvious character-focused episodes to be filler, and also mischaracterized Garnet as just being for exposition. I just don't have a lot of faith in her interpretation of the character writing. The sole exception to this, however, is Rose Quartz, who is a culmination of all of Sugar's failings as a writer and is such a critical character despite never appearing in the present time. And as such, she gets her own section detailing the, uh, problematic clusterfuck that is her story. No! Even if we don't agree, nobody deserves this! Steven has never been able to catch a break in this series. He goes from being this really annoying kid who doesn't seem to be aware of what's going on around him to just a hanger-on who doesn't do much except watch other people solve problems, and then he learns the magical trick of talking the monster down which he uses over and over and over again and then becomes a waffling, wilting coward by the end of the series. Steven has something of a Twilight Sparkle problem in that he changes constantly based on whatever Sugar needs him to do. For example, Steven is no stranger to violence and throughout the majority of the series approaches fighting with either neutral detachment or perverse glee. Despite being something of a pacifist, Steven isn't particularly troubled by fighting itself, but because Bismuth wants to lean really hard on an anti-violence message, there are a lot of instances even 
even before the breaking point is revealed that Steven is visibly nervous and uncomfortable around rather standard training exercises. I will agree that they kind of go over the top on the way that he reacts to business training exercises, but they're mainly doing that because it's a kid's show and they need to be a little less subtle in setting up what's going to happen at the end of the episode. Her trying to kill him, which once again, uh, I feel like I am unwilling to listen to reason or understand a situation, I am going to kill you, is a very reasonable thing to fight against. Like, in theory, in principle, one could argue that Bismuth is right, on like a large political level, but this is a kid's show, and if a kid's show wants to emphasize the importance of not being violent, then that's fair too. And the fact that people can still empathize with Bismuth despite her being so openly violent is actually more of a testament to her being written as a morally gray character, especially since she isn't seen as just evil, but misunderstanding the situation, which also is then later amended once she understands the situation. Steven was at his best during season two, as this was after he stopped being just some idiot kid the gens were babysitting, and before he became such a sanctimonious coward. If we do everything they say, they might go easy on us. But they're mean. They hurt my friends! They hurt my face! They've got you here in prison! That's why we can't fight them. That's why we have to fight them! There's no reason to fight! Let me talk to her. Please! The fighting has to stop! We aren't enemies! We're family! It's really weird to consider the protagonist of a main show going from more willy-nilly with violence to let's try to solve this with words is somehow not good when that's a very clear and obvious character development that also is something that we would generally want kids to internalize. The nuance of adult life and sometimes you need to be violent is something that can come later down the road. Honestly, so far my biggest issue with the video is Lily keeps throwing out a bunch of anecdotal examples without actually going into enough detail or intentionally leaving out details that could contend for counter arguments. So the whole video is set up in an extremely manipulative way. Until we start getting into the more detailed examples, a lot of these are just like tons and tons of small statements that are half accurate. Steven doesn't really get to be a character because he has to spend all of his time being the vessel for Sugar's cry and forgive plot. Oh dear lord, where do I begin with Pearl? Pearl wasn't so much a good character that fell by the wayside as the series went on, so much as she was stitched together from various dark romance tropes from the word go. For the first two seasons, all we knew about Pearl was that she was in love with Rose, obsessively, and that she was racked with a combination of grief and trauma. There's a lot of other things we know about her, like her entire personality, the things that she's interested in. Why are these things that are completely thrown to the wayside in your description, and the only thing that's being considered is some level of trauma or sadness in her past? Most of the time, whenever you're talking about characters and character flaws, you're talking about personality traits and the way that they play off of each other, completely ignoring her characterization in actually being a character, rather than just different things that happened to her in the past. You know what? Wait, wait! This is the same issue as the plot thing! She's only considering the plot-relevant things that informed Pearl as a character in the past, rather than the actual characterization and character development aspects. This is... Even when talking about the characters, she can only focus on things that seem like plot threads within the ways that the characters are informed, rather than actually looking at personality traits and flaws and strengths in those character traits. Like, for example, she's extremely cleanly and neurotic, but she's also very disgusted by things. She's very intelligent and considers herself smart, but is also arrogant in that sort of Peggy Hill type of way, where whenever she's shown to not really understand the situation, she tries to play it off or pretend like it's a joke. This insecurity in Pearl's character is a pretty major part of her, but that insecurity isn't necessarily linked to any sort of trauma, more so with the ego messages that she tells herself on a regular basis that sometimes come into conflict with her actual actions. There's a ton of interesting stuff to say about Pearl, and you don't have to reach even slightly for it. Lily is either willfully mischaracterizing Pearl, or genuinely, at the time of this video, doesn't understand what characters are. Pearl was an erratic, dangerous character who rarely ever faced the consequences for her actions. Like that time she almost killed Steven in space. Or that time she almost let Steven fall to his death because she was freaking out over a sword. Or that time she almost ripped out Steven's gem. Pearl really wants to kill Steven. The part where she almost kills Steven in space because she wants to build a spaceship and it ends up being this dangerous thing? That is a genuine moment of psychosis. She isn't trying to kill him in space. She's become so delusional with how much she misses Rose that she's, like, started to lose touch with reality. In the second example, as she shows the footage of Steven falling, Pearl is freaking the heck out and thinks that he's gonna die. She only lets him stay there once she realizes that he's fine and okay. She was immediately going to save him because that, that it's literally what she's doing. She's like getting ready to, she's freaking out, and then she looks over and sees he's fine. In the third example, with her trying to pick the gym out of Steven's belly, he was a baby. He was just born. There's never in the history of gym kind ever been a combination 
of Jim with another species. And so they legitimately don't know if it's the same being, a separate being, if you could separate the beings after the fact. They don't know any of that. And that's something that you see literally with White Diamond as she tries to pull Pink out of Steven, not realizing they're the same thing. It's her realization that they are one in the same that causes one of the overarching changes in White's point of view. So literally none of these events are being characterized accurately. Pearl greatly suffers from the fact that Rebecca Sugar keeps adding extremely dark content to her story for tertiary reasons and doesn't do anything with it. Much of what made Pearl interesting in that she was dealing with loss over a loved one and that love being unrequited, which is something never done with a gay character, was destroyed once it was revealed that Pearl was literally Rose's slave. Sugar actually went on to an interview to describe the dynamic between them as if Alfred was in love with Batman. Not Bruce, just Batman. Sugar doesn't seem to grasp that there's a reason Alfred isn't in love with Batman, because he's a surrogate father to him, and that would be really f***ed up. Also, Batman doesn't own Alfred, and Alfred is paid, you stupid fucking- So the characterization of Pearl as a slave is also willfully ignoring a major aspect, which is that Rose doesn't want Pearl to see her that way, insists on her not seeing that way, essentially says, don't serve me, I am going to go against the gems, you should go, etc. I mean, is there ever a moment when Pink starts to go against Homeworld that she ever treats Pearl like that? No, it's obviously a very consensual and mutual relationship between the two. Is it a weird power dynamic? Sure. Could you complain about the power dynamic? Sure. It's also not a very rare or unconventional character dynamic to see, which once again makes me think Steven Universe is only getting the focus because they happen to be queer characters. I mean, Belle in Beauty and the Beast is ten times more a quote-unquote slave than Pearl is to Rose Quartz. And is the relationship between Beauty and the Beast somewhat problematic in different ways? Absolutely. But if someone came up to you saying, I think it's disgusting that Belle is a slave, it's crazy that the creators would... Like, you would be like, whoa, chill out, buddy. Amethyst is the character who suffers the most from Steven Universe's lopsided approach to storytelling. Her character arc about dealing with her inadequacies is never really resolved. It just kind of vanishes after meeting the other Amethysts who were made in the same kindergarten. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For the majority of the first season, Amethyst was the cool big sis of the group. She mostly existed to take the piss out of Garnet and Pearl. This went as far as for the other gems to treat her like an animal at times. Like when Pearl asked if they were really gonna let Steven keep a lion, and Garnet replied, We kept Amethyst. This continued for a while, and Amethyst was a character- That's a hilarious line, by the way. The delivery of We Kept Amethyst is actually a hilarious part of the show. Regarded with derision by a lot of people, which matched up nicely to the derision she was given by everyone except Steven. Then on the run happened. Amethyst took Steven to the kindergarten she was made in, and then complete tonal whiplash occurred as Amethyst attacks Pearl in a rage before loudly vocalizing her self-hatred at being a homeworld gem. It only feels sudden because Steven doesn't have context to the previous relationship within Pearl and Amethyst, and Pearl and Amethyst are constantly on the outs. It's a continuation of the general dynamic that has been boiling in the last few episodes leading up to that. Is it a bit of tonal whiplash? Yes, but it's one that's well substantiated with their character arcs in the episodes leading up to it. That's Amethyst. This is where the problem start, because this was completely abandoned until reformed, where Amethyst's self-loathing returns in the form of, well, her form. Except Amethyst is characterized as someone who tries to escape and run away from her issues by ignoring them, pressing them down, and not facing them. So seeing her actively deal with the issue in a bunch of straight back-to-back -back serialized episodes would actually be somewhat of a counter to her characterization. It makes a lot more sense that it would bubble up only now and then, because that's how a lot of people are. And considering that the show has plenty of other people who aren't like that, it's good to have that variety. When Garnet remarks that her new forms look ridiculous, Amethyst flies into a rage and her inadequacy issues come up for the second time and was abandoned again until Cry for Help, where Amethyst sings about being inadequate to Sardonyx. It's abandoned again until Crack the Whip in Steven vs. Amethyst, where Jasper taunts her about being overcooked, and is then abandoned again until the zoo, where Amethyst meets the other Amethyst from the same kindergarten and sees that they're all overcooked and defective like she is. At time of writing, it hasn't come up since then, and it looks like it won't come up ever again as Amethyst she says it hasn't come up since then, but she's literally showing an episode where Amethyst and Steven are sitting there whenever they're looking for Ruby, that's what this episode is from, where Amethyst is the one who tells Steven that they need to take care of themselves too and understand that, which is actually a huge amount of character growth that you wouldn't initially see in the original Amethyst that shows that she values herself as a person and isn't as insecure to not live up to people's standards anymore. Lily is literally showing part of the character growth of Amethyst on screen while saying that that character growth has not happened since then. Garnet. Garnet was something of an interesting character, at least until it was revealed that she was a fusion. For the first season, she what? was a grounded and sensible straight arrow to Pearl and Amethyst bullshit, often showing genuine compassion for Steven that no other character seems to show. One episode has Garnet give Steven her powers of clairvoyance, and Steven goes absolutely ballistic because he sees millions of possible deaths for himself, leading to this rather touching line. Steven, I see so many things that can hurt you. I should never have let one of them be me. That's a really touching moment, and Garnet was full of them in the first season. Once it was revealed that she was a fusion, however... Oh boy. Garnet got demoted to extra the moment this happened, except in instances where Fusion was the subject of an episode. All episodes where Garnet plays a major role, Fusion was involved somehow. So are you telling me putting a character in situations that are thematically relevant to their personal struggles is a bad thing? 
That's like complaining that most of the characters in The Sopranos are always dealing with something related to the Mafia, rather than, like, taking a trip to Wisconsin to have some nice Culvers. Obviously, you're gonna write characters that represent certain issues thematically, and then write scenarios that allow you to explore those concepts thoroughly. You're not gonna throw characters that have nothing to do with broader concepts into concepts that weren't built for them, because what you're able to extract from that situation is completely different. Her having that moment with the people who are forced to fuse together, that is a very emotional moment, and it's something that she has personal insight into. Imagine if you had one of those classic episodes where some scientist character discovers some horrifying experiments, and they explain it to the rest of the characters, and they're like, I can't believe this happened. They combined this with this. It was terrible what they did here. Now imagine if that character, uh, was like a veterinarian instead, uh, just for no reason, and they didn't really understand any better than anyone else did, but like, some of the things made sense? You could maybe get something compelling or interesting out of it. I'm not saying you couldn't wholesale, but it obviously lends itself more naturally to the narrative if you build character prompts and characters to fit with each other more logically. Complaining that Garnet is always dealing with issues related to fusion is like complaining that a gay character is dealing with homophobia. It seems willfully reductive. Once fusion became a major aspect of the series, Garnet just stopped being a character. She was a vector to talk about fusion. She was a plot device whenever Ruby and Sapphire had to split up. A plot device when Ruby and Sapphire had to split up. Think about what Lily is talking about here. Lily's talking about Garnet, learning that Pearl had kept a secret from them for a long time that completely changes her perspective on the person who saved her life. This emotional split causes even the strong as iron combination of Ruby and Sapphire to feel emotionally conflicted with each other enough to split and then have to reorganize and rethink about their own priorities and identities. This is a major character development that has very little to actually do with her fusion that is now being called a plot device, despite the fact that she called these exact same episodes filler earlier. It seems like she just fundamentally doesn't understand anything that's going on in the show and is continually re-characterizing her own characterization of the exact same thing to fit multiple different scenarios of complaints. If you were to jot down what Lily's opinions are on certain episodes, you would have to write contradictory statements at this point. The complete neglect of Garnet is one of the series' major low points because Garnet was such a fan favorite for so long and was shunted aside in favor of more Steven, Rose, and the Diamonds. I feel like Garnet gets a bunch of major episodes and some of the most major songs and then also gets the last major character arc before the final diamond arc. It's strange to say that she was shunted aside. Peridot is arguably the best character in the show. Uh, I agree. Maybe. I don't know if she's the best. She is my favorite. I love Peridot. This is something Lily and I can agree on. We can, we can be best friends and hug it out and... I love Peridot. Peridot, I love Peridot. Peridot's awesome. I love Peridot of a lot of Steven Universe's characters is that they struggle with insecurities, trauma, or other assorted personal demons that they do little about except sulk. What makes Peridot so great is the fact that she has none of that shit! Peridot is introduced making a routine check on the cluster before getting trapped on Earth and is so terrified that she'll be stuck there when the cluster emerges that even Thunder sends her into a panic and clinging to Steven for support. There are many aspects of Earth's organic nature that she is unaware of, and as a result, many things can easily trick her into thinking the cluster is about to emerge. She enters a tenuous alliance with the Crystal Gems to stop the cluster, where she gains a better appreciation for them, Earth, and living outside Homeworld's rigid caste system. After that, there wasn't really much to do with Peridot, and her two biggest episodes after the cluster arc were her trying to bubble a gem monster, and her having to deal with the fact that she doesn't have powers. I'll level with you guys. Too Short to Ride is my favorite episode of the series because it involves Peridot coming to terms with the fact that she's a stunted gem like Amethyst. I will agree, Too Short to Ride is a great episode. Anyway, Peridot clings to Tech as a sort of prosthetic because Era 2 Peridots either don't have powers, or in her case have extremely weak powers. Steven tries to make up for destroying her limit hunters by giving her a tape recorder to keep logs in, which Peridot appreciates very much. Then Lapis destroys it. After the cluster arc, Steven gives Peridot a tablet, to which Peridot is ecstatic and cherishes like she did her tape recorder. Then Amethyst tries to throw it in the ocean. She insists that Peridot doesn't need it, because Amethyst doesn't understand exactly why Peridot is so dejected about not having powers. And Peridot freaks out. No! You don't need it! You don't know that! Yes! I do! Wait, oh wait, no! It's all that I am! The panic and desperation in Peridot's voice just... I felt that. When you have possessions you care about, especially when they're a gift from the closest thing you have to family, those things have a strong personal value to you. Peridot got her tablet as a gift, a very thoughtful gift from Steven. Something Steven gave her because he knows that tech is very important to Peridot. And then Amethyst tries to f***ing trash it. Why is everyone breaking Peridot's gifts from Steven? In her panic, Peridot discovers that she can actually move metal, which, okay on reflection, we should have seen that coming, but still. It's only the sheer desperation she's feeling that even unlocks this, and while Steven and Amethyst are freaking out about it, you can see Peridot very carefully navigate her tablet safely back to shore. The sheer amount of crap Peridot goes through in this one episode alone is intense, and contains more actual character work than nearly every other episode combined. Just... 
Can someone please give this gem a hug? After this point, Peridot didn't star much. She mostly played comic relief to other characters and stuck around to be a support for others once in a while. But once her arc was actually done, nobody really knew what to do with her. It was almost like Sugar realized that, unlike any other character, Peridot was just finished. Peridot was a three-dimensional character, something Sugar is completely unfamiliar with. Now what do we do? So yeah, Peridot just fell by the wayside until season 5 where she had a brief stint of depression after Lapis left and she was just dealing with the breakup, so she took up gardening. But because she tried to bring life back to the kindergarten and failed, she has a breakdown over the fact that she's likely never getting her home or Lapis back again. We're gonna talk about Lapis in just a moment, but I find Lapis and Peridot's relationship fascinating. She claims that Peridot has no growth after the cluster arc, but then says her favorite episode with the most growth with Peridot is too short to ride, which is like a season later, and then also talks about the major character arc and her stint of depression and freaking out because of the way that Lapis treats her and leaves and everything and her breakup. So like, <laughs> even though it's not, it's not an actual breakup, but it's a breakup. So she's actively mentioning multiple large focused character arcs that are going on with Peridot after the cluster arc. You can't just say something and then substantiate the opposite of your point. I mean, you can, but it doesn't logically follow. Cruelty that Peridot is aware of, but seemingly doesn't care about. Even when Lapis takes all of her things and flees to the moon, there's seemingly no anger toward Lapis at all, just a stint of depression that she's gone. Oh boy. So the idea behind Lapis is pretty sound. Sugar wanted to write a character arc about an abuse victim recovering from an unhealthy relationship, and we know this because she admitted to it. This is something that's rarely ever talked about with LGBT characters and can actually take advantage of the fact that the gems are monogender. Most of the episodes that heavily feature Lapis deal with her supposed trauma at her relationship with Jasper at the bottom of the ocean, her slow progress in regards to adjusting to Earth, Earth, especially compared to Navy Ruby, and her budding relationship with Peridot. So you're getting the groundwork laid for an arc about an abuse victim recovering from trauma. This just one little itty bitty niggling problem. Huh? I'm done being everyone's prisoner. Now you're my prisoner. I can't get distracted. I, I've got to hold us down with the weight of your planet's ocean. I liked taking everything out on you. Lapis does have a lot of issues. This is a more nuanced thing, and I can understand why people would think that she is abusive, especially towards Peridot. But calling her an abuser explicitly towards Jasper seems really disingenuous and kind of victim blamey. Think about the full story of what happened to Lapis. I mean, you can't just ignore the context that happens prior. She was trapped in a mirror for like 500 million years, and then eventually Steven manages to free her. She knows nothing about the outside world or what's going on, except for that the last thing she knew, the Crystal Gems weren't really the good guys. So, she's running away, trying to fight, doesn't know what's going on, eventually returns to Homeworld, hoping that they will help her or let her know what's going on. Instead, she's taken advantage of, abused. Right as she was barely able to get freed, she ends up being forced to go back and hurt the people who freed her. Because of her defiance and unwillingness to really go along with it, she is trapped in a jail cell whenever they return to Earth, being only used basically as an assistance for navigation. After being trapped for so, so long and barely having the strength and energy to run and ask for help, the people she asks help from end up trapping her once again. And hey, who's one of the main people who trap her? Jasper. As Steven comes to rescue her, something that Lily actually shows earlier in the video, Lapis actually tells him not to rescue her and that she's giving up, that they're mean, that there's no way to win, she's completely given up as a person. She views her own abuse as something inevitable. So Jasper, who forced her to go along with this and sent her back to Earth in this situation, then begins to come on to her in a way that is completely non-consensual. Obviously, some people have read a sexual connotation to this, but I'm not necessarily going there. Eventually, after being pushed and severely threatened, knowing that if she tells Jasper no and they get back to Homeworld and Jasper lets them know, then that will probably be the death of her. She decides to do one thing. Instead of letting Jasper pull the trigger and take out these people, the only people in thousands of years to give her a chance and help her, she decides to agree to Jasper's evil action and then twist that against her. Jasper is the one who wanted to fuse and do this big evil thing. Lapis is just turning it on Jasper. That doesn't seem abusive to me. She drags Jasper to the bottom of the ocean, and in restraining and trapping someone, in being able to regain some of that power that she hasn't had in so, so long and inflict some of that suffering on Jasper, like Jasper has inflicted on her, she realizes that she actually enjoys it too. It's a mutual toxic relationship. In this episode, when Jasper is insisting they come together, 
because Jasper loves power, Jasper loves strength and nothing else, and feels so much stronger. It's almost like a high whenever they're with Lapis. Lapis states the obvious, that neither of them are good for each other, that she sees bad parts of herself, where she ends up giving in and starting to abuse Jasper back whenever Jasper abuses her. It's a mutual toxic relationship. Framing Jasper as somehow the abused and Lapis as the abuser rather than a mutual relationship or an example of revenge from someone who was previously being abused is kind of icky. I know I'm not the only one who notices this, but in every case that is supposed to demonstrate the unhealthy relationship between Lapis and Jasper, it's Lapis who is the abuser in that scenario. Think about that. In every situation. What I just told you is an accurate representation of what happens in the story. There's more context in what I said than any of these cheap clips that Lily's putting up. Is Lapis really the abuser in that situation? If you think that, I severely want you to reconsider, because this is the exact sort of interpretation that leads people to not believe victims when they try to escape just because they are not perfectly pure in the situation. Someone reaching out trying to get help, somebody wanting to escape a situation but failing to, the person trying to escape is still less abusive than the person trying to keep the abuse going. She pulled a fast one on Jasper by agreeing to fuse, only to then trap them at the bottom of the ocean. Change. But why did Jasper want to fuse? Why was Jasper pushing and forcing Lapis to fuse? Oh, yeah, because Jasper wanted to murder all of the people who helped free Lapis for a brief second. Should Lapis have just done the casual non-abusive behavior of letting someone murder everyone who ever helped you? Classic abuser behavior, lying to a murderer so they don't kill your friends and family. Da 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 there for over a year and then admitted to it. This doesn't even go to Sugar's usual problem of just disregarding things in previous episodes to suit her tunnel vision. The episode that's supposed to establish Lapis as an abuse victim does the exact opposite because Sugar writes like somebody who has never left her house or indeed spoken to another human being. Even after this blunder, Lapis continues to be a pretty nasty person. Now that's to be expected. Anybody who has even a cursory experience with abuse knows that it does not create nice people and it's just as easy to believe that Lapis's trauma comes from being trapped in the mirror for thousands of years instead. It wasn't the fact that Lapis was a raging shit heel that made her so contentious. It was the fact that she repeatedly took that out on the one character people actually liked. You see, audiences are biased by nature and the quickest way for a character to piss away any sympathy one might have had for them is to kick the fandom's favorite person. Peridot was that character and arguably the most well-designed crystal gem the series had. She had a good redemption arc, actually helped save the world, mouth off to a fascist dictator, actually learned to deal with her problems, and outside of those instances was one of the funniest characters in the supporting cast. And she was the one who reached out to Lapis and tried really hard to make her feel welcome, despite Lapis treating her like dirt at every possible opportunity. What inevitably happened was Lapis found a new victim. But because Sugar continues to write for the character she- Lapis found a new victim. Goddamn. It is true that Lapis does victimize Peridot a lot and treat her very unfairly. And I think it's true that a lot of these behaviors, well, never justifiable, or at least understandable from the trauma and situation that she came from. What's wrong, Lapis? She's the one who dragged me back to Earth. I was headed to Earth and I needed an informant. You used me like everyone else did. It's different now. I'm different. I forgot that the last time you saw each other wasn't so okay. Also, many times when Lapis does things to hurt Peridot, it's purely because of misunderstanding and not really realizing what the thing meant. For example, when Peridot gifts her the recorder, which did actually break my heart, it's not something that Lapis is actually privy to the full context of. Still, this carelessness can be criticized, but it's in the very least not malicious. Lapis does care about Peridot, Lapis is just very complicated emotionally. Maybe too complicated. I do think the Lapis probably has the most writing issues, but it's not nearly to the extreme that's being described here. Think she wrote, rather the one that she actually wrote, and has an understanding of abuse on par with Dr. Wolf, this all goes unaddressed and more time is spent reinforcing how sad and angsty Lapis is. This all comes to a very heated conclusion in Raising the Bar, where the fear of being caught up in another war makes Lapis want to leave Earth. The entire episode is one long string of Lapis being the fucking worst, but a personal highlight goes to this scene. I can't. I won't let myself get caught up in another war. Imagine writing out and animating a scene this sinister looking and still being under the impression that you're writing an abuse victim. Now, this sinister looking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking. <laughs> two, two bright, bright blue and green characters. One with a very mixed expression and one who looks kind of upset. Imagine you're writing a scene this sinister looking. It's just two fucking cartoon characters with one on the other's shoulder. Imagine you're writing a scene this sinister looking. There's like a sunny sky in the background with some clouds. <laughs> 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 oh, 
Imagine you're writing a show this sinister looking. They're like lime green and blueberry colored. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, serious response. Serious response. <laughs> serious response. Serious response. Considering Lapis's entire character arc is about the fact that she's given up on running away, this and her actually being able to run away is a good reflection on how she's growing and changing as a character. But it's an overcorrection. It's something toxic and bad. Something that she ends up talking to Steven about on the moon, which eventually leads to enough forethought by herself, because that's how Lapis is. She's the sort of person who really needs time to think things through to herself, before she eventually ends up actually helping in the fight against the diamonds. Her taking the house? Super scummy. Her being mean to Peridot makes me sad, because I love Peridot. But... On an overarching, like, character growth type of situation, I think it's interesting to write a character that doesn't just start with a problem, solve the problem, but rather starts with a problem, overcorrects, then recorrects again. And having that be sort of messy in regards to everything not resolving perfectly is kind of fine, actually, and is something that otherwise Lily criticizes in the show. Imagine writing out and animating a scene this sinister looking. <laughs> Imagine writing a scene this sinister looking. Small pumpkin puppy cowers behind little green shoes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry still being under the impression that you're writing an abuse victim. Now, this could have all been potentially interesting. I like the idea, need to reinforce the idea, of a story about an abuser going through their own personal redemption story, changing their ways, making a turnaround for themselves. But that idea can only happen when the writer is aware of who this character is, and Sugar remains blissfully ignorant of that fact. I do think that there are issues or things that could have been handled better with Lapis's character, but Lily's assertion that she somehow understands these characters better than Rebecca Sugar does is really laughable and ridiculous, considering the way that she characterized Garnet, especially Garnet. See this clearly in the episodes where Lapis's trauma is the central focus, when in this position, she's almost a completely different person, which is jarring to say the least. You could have been me! Ugh. Just a joke. Jasper was arguably the first villain the show ever had, and as far as setting up a conflict, they nailed it with Jasper. There was never really much to Jasper, just a lot of preaching about purging the weak and hating things she views as a crutch while simultaneously trying to weaponize them. Yeah, Sugar mostly just hyped up a boss fight with her. Even at the end of Jailbreak, she fuses with Lapis, who proceeds to trap her under the ocean to torture her. Unfortunately, when Jasper came out, she was different. Jasper is consistently a might-makes-right character all the way, even to future. It takes Steven almost killing Jasper in future for her to somewhat reform her ways, and even then, she's still, by the end, a might-makes-right type of character. Any sort of change that she gained was mainly just giving more nuance, but her central ideology, driving principles, opinions, feelings on things, never changes. I mean, she never even joins the Crystal Gems. Saying Jasper was somebody who was racked by self-loathing, and... Really? Another self-loathing plot? Regardless, we don't get to do much with that as Jasper is immediately def- Another? <laughs> who is the first self-loathing plot? defeated in a fusion battle and then corrupted because she fused with a corrupted gem. This is probably the closest the show has ever come to literally bullshitting their way out of a plot, and it's mostly because of the Steven-focused morality the show has. To put it simply, because we're going to expand on it later, if Steven likes someone, then there are a million excuses and that wasn't so bad for their actions. But if Steven doesn't like someone, they deserve to choke. This would be an interesting character flaw if it weren't for the fact that the show is using this metric to determine who the sympathetic and irredeemable characters are, so Jasper and Kevin are terrible, but the consistently worse Diamonds, Lars, Ronaldo, Lapis, and Andy are sympathetic. <laughs> Consistently worse. <laughs> the most iconic part from this video that I remember is Lily's, like, extreme meltdown over a specific episode with Kevin. Jasper is literally a might-makes-right fascist. She's literally, like, the textbook example of a might-makes-right authoritarian person. She's very bad. She's literally the exact same ideology as Yellow Diamond. It's not like Steven ever is like, let's make them choke. Steven is still trying to mend the relationship with Jasper in future. And Kevin? I mean, I don't know. I don't feel like they really crap on or consider him evil or really consider him good. They mainly play him as kind of a joke character who's maybe a little creepy. Is Lars a pretty obnoxious character who they paint as sympathetic? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, we'll get into the rest of the characters, I guess. The show says, Steven likes this person, therefore you should too. You are to leave the cluster. So I know they can only make so many points at a time, and they're bound to mention or allude to things that they haven't yet talked about, but we are 36 minutes into the video, and she still hasn't really substantiated most of the opinion she has. She's just stating general things that kind of sound true, as if they're true, without actually establishing them with any sort of argument or evidence. 
Like, if this was a video that was structured with any sort of coherence, she would have thrown out the sympathetic, non-sympathetic, and then explained in detail how that works if she wanted to make a point. But instead she's throwing it out, and since she goes by really quick, you might think, yeah, you know, they are kind of sympathetic, and yeah, these ones aren't that sympathetic. But in reality, Kevin just isn't really given much either way. And Jasper is actively trying to kill them most of the time that she's on screen. So, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Yellow Diamond is the proof that everything Sugar says about having planned everything from the start is a complete lie. When Yellow Diamond first appeared, she was exactly the kind of character we had come to expect from all the setup. Menacing, ruthless, and cold-hearted. She was posed, animated, and voiced perfectly. What do I mean when I say this? Well, the Diamonds are all blatant space Nazis, right down to committing at least two acts of genocide. There isn't much you can do with that as far as complexity goes, unless you're a shit person, so all you can really do is instill a feeling in the viewer of, kicking your ass is going to be fun. This tends to be why the more overtly totalitarian a character is, the more they're reduced to just a string of intimidating poses and ass kicking. It's all saying, here's our villain, they kick so much ass, so it's gonna be all the sweeter when we grind their face into the dirt. There's just one problem, Sugar hated it. Sugar didn't write this episode, and apparently hated Yellow Diamond in this so much that she personally wrote and storyboarded her next appearance in That Will Be All, which had her radically changed from being ruthless and cold-hearted to repressing her grief over the loss of Pink Diamond. After this, her next appearance was in The Trial, also not written by Sugar, and Yellow was back to being a colorful Darth Vader. Oh, disregard that last statement! I might have gotten carried away! You can see this pushing and pulling with Yellow throughout the series, and depending on who is writing her, she becomes a completely different character. For a while, someone was pushing back against Sugar's insistence that the villains be sad little babies, but Sugar ultimately won out, and by the time of Reunited, Yellow was racked with grief and immediately experiences a turnaround as Steven literally bullshits everyone's problems away, and oh. My. God. Of the four diamonds, Yellow Diamond was the biggest disappointment because she was the only one introduced as a villain, and whom Sugar had to keep with in order to break her into her terrible, sad mold. I think my perspective on this might be different because I didn't have, like, months and months between episodes or years between episodes. I wasn't watching lots of theory videos or personal opinions, so I didn't really have a lot of time to, like, quell on exactly what kind of person Yellow Diamond was between her first and second appearance. I don't think that she really changes all that much, though. If anything, her second appearance is just giving her more character. Like, you get the general impression of a character first, and then you understand the more underlying details. Having a more complex, well-written character is not a character flaw in and of itself, even if they're evil. And it's not like they become less evil, they just happen to have a weak spot, specifically towards blue, which is something that leans more into the color coding of the diamonds and how they link to parts of cognitive psychology, but I'm gonna get into that later, probably, because... That's a huge spiel. Blue Diamond is arguably one of the worst characters in the show because from the moment of her debut, her actual debut, she was nothing but a grief-wracked mess that's supposed to be sympathetic to people who don't know what sympathetic is. Personally, I find something rather disgusting in Blue Diamond being portrayed as having grieved for thousands of years over the loss of Pink Diamond, while holocausting both Crystal and Homeworld gems both before and after that time for various reasons, up to and including mouthing off, being defective, fusing, and just because she feels like it. One of the major things to keep in mind with the Diamonds is how they view things on foreign planets. Diamonds already associate within different types of gems, different types of things that are maybe more analogous to race. Beyond that, you have the other organic life that's non-gem life, non-eternal. It's short, finite, limited, to a span that maybe a fly is to a human. That's how they view humanity as a whole and a lot of these other organic matter. They only view it as a beehive willing to scoop out the honey. The only thing is, unlike bees, at least as far as we know, the things they're killing are actually sentient. However, they refuse to listen to this or take credit. Pink Diamond fusing with this organic matter forced them to recognize in some way or another that they have been ruining and ending millions of lives for who knows how many years. Just because you have a character crying all the time doesn't necessarily mean that they're painted as automatically sympathetic. I, at least that's not how I personally felt with Blue Diamond. I just thought that she was weird, and they were obviously playing on one side as logic, one side as emotion. Safe and sound. White Diamond was Sugar's last ditch effort to make the other three diamonds look sympathetic in the face of mounting and severe criticism of the way she was writing. Introduced with shudders and dread, showcased as a towering figure that talks like Mother Gothel, and whose pearl is a cracked eye in a thousand yard stare, and the implication that she has Pink Diamond's original pearl because of the way their gems are positioned, and that theory is just stupid enough to actually be canon. White Diamond was an enigma for a long time and is presented as the true villain by being a Tons scarier than the villains we've already had. When light passes through a gem, it creates color. A perfect equilibrium of all colors is white, and yet also the lack of all color is still white. White Diamond disconnected from her logic and her emotion. She disconnected from everything in order to perceive herself as a perfect being. However, operating cold, soulless, almost like a machine, was not the way to work. Instead, she needed to accept all of the color. 
She needed to acknowledge the logic at her left and the emotion at her right. She needed to acknowledge the freedom, spontaneity, love, and joy of life. It's only in integrating aspects of the personalities of all three other diamonds is White able to balance and become the person they were truly made to be. There's a point that Blue Diamond tells Stephen of early in the series, where apparently White used to join the meetings with them, come to the balls, have fun, where they didn't operate under this strict no-nonsense deal. Logic has a tendency to go along with what makes sense, but emotion takes the brunt of all of the bad things that come from logic without warning. Since White is the leader, and she stops heeding guidance from her emotions and from her logic, she becomes this cold, unfeeling monster. The only way to change her mind is to reintroduce her to the joy of life, and the reason why we do the actions that we do. I have my own Steven Universe video that's coming eventually. It's not going to be more freeform like this video has been, instead it's going to be fully scripted and written. And I hope that you'll hear my full interpretation, because it is how I interpreted the show when I saw it, just binging it all at once, and also seems to be the most substantiated and pretty straightforward way of interpreting the show. Gems, as things that reflect light. What colors do they reflect? All of the blue gems that serve under blue are more emotionally driven, like Lapis. All of the yellow gems that serve under yellow are more logic-based, like Peridot. All of the ones who seek to find their own way in life. All the ones who seek spontaneity, freedom, love, enjoyment. All of those serve under pink. I know this is probably a lot to take in the way I'm saying it right now, but if you would like to see that video, please subscribe, like, comment, obviously, if you haven't already. But also, uh, I'm financially pretty desperate, so uh, I would appreciate any Patreon donations. This is the first time I'm asking, I think, in the uh, rough edit live recording of the video. Um, anyways, uh, let's go on with things. You can see that characters are the ones that suffer the most from Sugar's bad priorities and fragmented storytelling. When main characters have to deal with their issues, it happens extremely quickly because Sugar is cramming it all in at the last minute in order to make sure there's plenty of time for her Beach City Coffee Shop AU. This means character arcs have the simultaneous problem of being dragged out and rushed beyond belief as their issues are ignored or shrugged off for the majority of an arc before bolting to the finish line in the final episode, if at all. The only character I would say was handled well was Peridot, as once her arc was completed, she mostly became a mood lifter. And that's honestly what I think she works best as. The rest are scattered and Sugar doesn't seem to know what to do with them. So many characters just stand around doing nothing because they have to be there and it seems Sugar would rather find some excuse to write them out of the plot entirely. You know, at the same time I was writing this script, I was also covering Little Witch Academia on In A Minute, and I noticed a similar thing happened there, where the main cast shifts in the second half of the series and the fun characters get demoted to extra while being replaced by characters that are far less interesting. And now I'm wondering something. You see, Steven Universe is chock full of anime references. Like, way too many. The crew is really obsessed with anime and shoves references into it at every possible opportunity, and I think they're shoving it into their writing as well. That would explain why character arcs get rushed in order to get to the next poorly animated fight scene. I like anime. That's not really an accurate representation of it. That wasn't really a point. Uh, she basically said nothing of substance for like two minutes. I might not even leave in the entire thing. And then ended it with a joke shitting on the entire animated art of an entire culture and race of people. When it comes to LGBT representation, Steven Universe got a free ride on low expectations. Because LGBT relationships are rare in children's shows, a lot of people were prepared to claim Steven Universe is the pioneer of a new era in relationship design. Of course, all of this came about in the first season. That's not true. Season 5 has a gay wedding. People, like, exploded over that. I didn't even watch the show, and that's one of the few things that I knew beforehand. I didn't even know who the characters were, I just knew there was a gay wedding. It wasn't until the end of the first season that an actual relationship was even established in Ruby and Sapphire, and that's where the problems start. Defining LGBT people by the relationships that they are or aren't in isn't actually the LGBT rep that you think it is. Saying that a show has poor LGBT rep because nobody gets in a relationship in the first season is a really shallow interpretation of LGBT issues, primarily because this is a tactic a lot of right-wing people out there try to minimize when they say that being gay is just a sexual preference, a sexual deviance, a fetish, a kink, like many of the other videos that we already talked about already did. There are plenty of LGBT issues that are explored constantly through Steven Universe just from its breaking down of gender norms and its general exploration of more abstract queer themes. Is it good to also have a relationship? Yes, and there are multiple relationships also, but the most important thing that would actually be coming is the important lessons that kids learn that help them better accept themselves as they grow up and come to understand their identity, just in case it happens to be queer about how Garnet was an interesting idea of literally being a relationship, but with the show doing absolutely nothing with her- Once again, Garnet slander that's provably wrong. She has multiple arcs through season 3 and season 5 that all deal with her as a person and her relationship. 
it. Garnet was a very easy way to avoid doing any actual work with Ruby and Sapphire in regards to developing their relationship. If you recall last year in my Legend of Korra video, I talked about how one of the easiest ways to write a solid relationship is to start in medias res and make liberal use of couple banter. Those of you wanting to know how to write a relationship, that's a good foundation to get you started. Also comedy. This is the bare minimum standard that Steven Universe just can't commit to. Sugar always took every excuse she could to hide Ruby and Sapphire in the walk-in closet that is Garnet's hips. And this strikes me as surprising because when Garnet is unfused, Ruby and Sapphire are a surprisingly well-written and fun relationship. Either they're in the midst of a heated fight like in Keystone Motel, being adorable to the point of hilarious incompetence like in Hit the Diamond, or just being the rock, lol, that keeps the other grounded in a time of anxiety like in That Will Be All. They even have a big fight after the Pink Diamond revelation and it looks like they might break up and after a few episodes where Pearl gaslights Sapphire and Steven goes off to find Ruby, they not only make up, but they get engaged. I'll admit that caught me off guard because I thought they were already married. Incidentally, the episode where they get married is probably the best episode of the se- uh, Okay, it would be the best episode of the series, but in the last half, the space fascists crash the party and Steven tries to make friends with them. That's so how can you say- how can you say that they throw Garnet aside and don't explore queer relationships, and then list three separate, not just episodes, but giant segments of the story specifically going into the way that their relationship operates? That's a whole mess of- up that we'll get into later, although I find it both hilarious and sad that the first gay wedding in a children's show had to share its screen time with, look how sad these Nazis are. I mean, good on Rebecca Sugar for accurately reflecting modern politics, at least. For all of her failings in other areas, when it's time for Ruby and Sapphire to come out of their overcoat, Sugar shows a surprising ability to write a grounded, enjoyable relationship. When people talk about LGBT representation, this is it right here. Writing a good LGBT relationship is so easy that even Rebecca Sugar can do it when she's forced to. Even Rebecca Sugar can do it when she's forced to. She had to actively push against the censors to allow for that wedding for a long time. It's not something that she had forced on her, it's something that she actively had to push against the industry to literally make waves, to be the first person to do. If I remember right, this is something that's going to be a lot more common as it goes on, but the way that Rebecca is characterized consistently paints her as some sort of evil villain who accidentally did some good things, but then intentionally did everything bad that they could, and it's like, they're a bisexual, non-binary creator who was one of the first people pushing forward to make a show that actually represented queer issues, where even adult television is still failing to do it. It's just really weird to undermine Rebecca's role whenever something good happens, and then extremely over-exaggerate their incompetence and evil and, like, bad intent and racism and all these sorts of things anytime something bad happens. It's literally the most malicious possible way you could come to interpret them. Ruby and Sapphire locked inside Garnet at all times. This wouldn't be a problem if it weren't for the fact that Garnet saw a consistent and rapid decline from being the only gem with her head on straight to just being a vessel to give exposition about fusion, which only happens about 5% of the time in the series anyway. As a result, Ruby and Sapphire don't get to do much unless Garnet has become unstable, which has only happened on a few rare occasions. This is the fundamental problem of Garnet being a permafusion. Fusions are separate characters from the gems they're fused with, and only in rare instances do they function like two or more people. Fusions are different characters than the ones that they're fused as, but they are also representations of the relationship in a literal sense. But they're more so a combination of the consciousness of those two characters. You can see aspects of Ruby and Sapphire in nearly everything that Garnet does. The fact that Sapphire is so passive and Ruby is so proactive leads Garnet into being this sort of chill but proactive character. You can see the way that Ruby and Sapphire push and pull to make Garnet as a person. Garnet is only a different character from Ruby and and Sapphire in the literal sense of being written into the story as a separate character. Narratively, character building wise, all that, she's still separate. And if you're talking about a relationship, you are always showing that relationship in some context whenever Garnet's on screen. Even Universe is a pioneer of LGBT representation when the only two characters who further that idea aren't present for the vast majority of the series. The only other instance of this was Pearl's one-sided relationship with Rose, characterized for most of the series as a pathological obsession brought on by unrequited love. Garnet's one of the main characters of the series. Everything Garnet sees, Ruby and Sapphire see. Garnet is Ruby and Sapphire. Over losing Rose is an understatement. She's almost constantly falling apart at the seams. Considering the gems have been around for 6,000 years and Steven is only 14, Rose's absence is still very much a new thing for them. Pearl's creepy obsession with Rose was interesting for a while, but it got old very quickly. Even attempts to pair Pearl up with someone else were kneecapped by that someone else looking exactly like Rose. People ultimately got tired of Pearl's character going fucking nowhere outside of her unrequited love and were hoping Sugar would do something else with her. That unfortunately turned out to be a regret because what Sugar did was gross and horrifying. With a revelation that Rose's Pink Diamond also came the revelation that Pearl was Pink Diamond's Pearl, given to her as a slave. This fundamentally altered the dynamic between Rose and Pearl, as now we're being shown a slave falling in love with her master, and the show seeing absolutely nothing wrong with that. Pearls in the gym world are no more a slave than any other gym in any other job for the rest of their society. The whole thing operates like clockwork. No emotion, no feelings, just like automatic machines. The thing is, though, they do have feelings, and whenever they break free from that, they're able to start choosing for themselves, but they often don't know how to. 
In the case of Pearl and Pink Diamond, it's shown at later points, even when she resets in the movie, that Pearl's neuroticism and over-obsession is a major character flaw. But despite this, considering everything she did for Pink Diamond after Pink Diamond decided, hey, this is wrong, we need to stop it, was all based on her own consent and her own willingness and her own free will, it becomes very difficult to call it a slave relationship. They were in love. They were trying new things. Is it a toxic dynamic? Yes, but it's also less toxic than Beauty and the Beast. But no one bats an eye and claims that the writers of that were completely incompetent. And even before, as mentioned, this is a fairly common trope in a lot of romance. I don't know, just seems like a bit of an over-exaggeration. Who treats it as at best a quirk of their relationship and at worst as impossibly romantic. It's over, isn't it? Why can't I move on? Oh, we know why. Tell me to stop. Please don't ever stop. A slave falling in one-sided love with her master and said master taking advantage of that the way Rose did is an extremely dark story premise, but Sugar doesn't think of it that way. Steven Universe loves to talk about abuse as a central theme, and yet the biggest example of it is flown completely over Sugar's head. I don't think Rebecca does like to talk about abuse as a central theme. There are some characters who have had abusive situations happen to them, or just bad things that they've had to deal with in character growth, but think about, like, any random episode of Steven Universe. Like, like think of a, a cookie cat from the first episode. Is there, is there a deep theme of abuse there? Think of that episode where Steven gets really old. Is there a deep theme of abuse there? Think of the test. Is there a deep theme of abuse there? No. You know what there is in those three random episodes, like legitimately random, I just pulled them out of my head. It's about relationships, connection, trying to understand each other, empathize with each other, and help each other become greater people through our issues. Whether those issues be short-term, small, big, long-term, huge impactful, little impactful, trauma plays in as one of the things to be conquered, dealt with, or better understood, but it's not by any means a central theme that Rebecca loves to talk about. Pearl's neuroticism and over-obsession is a general character flaw that follows her with things even not applying to Rose. But you definitely can't assume that Rose had completely malicious intention whenever the don't stop, never stop line is carried out whenever her eyes are literally stars. The visual imagery of the scene is telling you that she is being authentic in that moment, not being manipulative, at least not in the intentional sense. And also, Pearl, as her own person set free and able to make her own decisions, someone thousands of years old, definitely has the ability to consent to that situation. ...single acknowledgement of just how fucked up this whole thing is. It's like reading erotic fanfiction written by the weirdest, scariest sub ever. Pearl's strange and lopsided relationship with Rose even extends to her relationship with Steven. Why are you here, Pearl? Me? Nothing. I was just, uh, well, you know how I always say, um, I just, uh... I like to watch you sleep sometimes. <laughs> and by sometimes, I mean often. Ha! <laughs> See? It's funny, because... Actually, that's not funny, that's just... It is funny! It is funny! She's a weird neurotic freak who thinks that Steven's gonna die because he's a fleshy human monster. She doesn't understand humans. She has a relationship with Rose. It's a lot of complicated feelings, and it is funny. It is funny. If you don't think it's funny, I'm very sorry. That is funny. It's a funny part. It's a funny joke. It's a good joke. Creepy. This is played for a joke. Sugar's idea of relationships is warped, to say the least. This is not good representation. There's a reason that stories about LGBT relationships rarely cover these kind of issues, and that's because when these issues are botched this badly, it ultimately ends up being a reinforcement for conservative paranoia about gay relationships as some kind of twisted deviancy and finds its way into the next bill to criminalize being gay. This actually buys into a certain mindset that has actually been railed against by a lot of black activists, where the idea of being the good one is something you have to do just in case a white person sees you because you represent your entire community and you aren't allowed to just live and be the person that you are? Why are we policing what queer people are able to say in their own queer stories because we're afraid that homophobic people will rail on us even harder? Saying that these stories are somehow broached rarely by queer people, which is not even slightly true, and saying that it's not done because if you mess it up bad, it fuels things for conservatives is also wrong. I mean, we watched the ER video. We watched the Easy Peasy video. Those people literally just think, oh, multiple kind of women things taking care of child? This is evil lesbian grooming from the Jews. You don't need to give them an excuse to hate you. They're going to hate you no matter what. And if that hate is built on a relationship that you've decided to put forward in a piece of art, why should we police the stories about our experiences based on the people who hate us? I understand that there's a need for some sense of optics, but we shouldn't be prioritizing the over-emotional feelings of people who want us dead instead of actually authentically expressing our experiences.
this is an experience that has a lot of relatability through the queer community in multiple ways. It's not always great, it's sometimes messy, and sometimes both parties are wrong in some ways. It's fine to write flawed characters in complicated situations, and it's not just wrong because maybe a conservative will use it to hate us a little bit more. Personally, I try to be the best person I can, substantiate myself as well as I can, and also, not bend or change myself to fit better with the people who will hate me no matter what. Something of an unspoken agreement to not cover those things until it can be certain that they won't become arrows in the quiver of the banned gays crowd. It actually seems the opposite is true in regards to things like black advocacy, as it sort of perpetuates the idea of white supremacy and allows people to constantly live under that boot instead of trying to carve something new for themselves. This is the same logic that forces every black experience to be framed under whiteness, rather than allowing people to live their own lives. For anyone who's followed along with me so far and heard me throw out the big, you know, lefty terms, if you don't understand what I mean, it's fine. I'm not going to go into crazy detail of it right now. There's a lot of other resources that go into more detail. You'll see that this sort of activism generally is pretty unproductive. It's the same sort of thing people would say of don't make trans people look bad. If you can't avoid being clocked, you shouldn't identify as trans. It's a very bigoted mindset that ends up reinforcing and decreasing the power of people who are already oppressed minorities, rather than letting them outstretch their wings and develop their rights and grow for themselves. Conservatives and their stubborn bigotry are the reason LGBT representation is as politicized as it is. Having the biggest concentration of representation come from such a myopic, melodramatic, and reckless person like Rebecca Sugar is not the political milestone so many people think it is. Handling those things well would be great. It'd be amazing if a show talked about gay relationships and talked about how just like straight relationships, they can be rockier, sometimes unhealthy, and actually stuck the landing. But doing that is extremely difficult, and Sugar continues to put her- I won't let myself get caught up in another war. It's amazing that they put such a dark situation here with the bright- blue and the bright green. She's a little uncomfortable, and she's a little upset. It's still hilarious that this is being framed like, I can't believe they did this. Something so sinister. <laughs> foot in her mouth by coming up to instances of clear and obvious abuse and saying, how romantic. This is before we even address the fact that LGBT characters in the series are exclusively restricted to the gems, a monogendered race of aliens. This conveniently sidesteps the usual conservative freakout that the show might otherwise garner, but in doing so gives the implicit lesson that giving valuable representation is second priority to placating a group of emotionally stunted crybabies. That so here's the weird thing. She just contradicted herself. She just told us, unless we can tell our own stories about ourselves perfectly, then we should stay in the closet and not tell anybody. But also, Rebecca, by not making them explicitly gay, is kowtowing to conservatives and not representing things well. So which is it? You can't claim that queer people aren't allowed to write queer stories unless they do everything perfectly how you want so that conservatives won't get mad, which they'll get mad anyways, and then also claim that these stories, which you think are poorly written queer stories, are not queer enough, they're actually already kowtowing to it. How are they both? How? Another thing, by making them monogender gems with extremely varied body types, they actually allow for more people to implicitly impress onto them their personal experiences. They allow more people to explore their gender identity and understanding of themselves as a person. That monogender being represented as femme also gives more opportunities to people who may not otherwise see body types of that type and might see one that they relate to. The gems, while focusing on the more abstract, cognitive, and sort of thematic side of things, end up actually serving as allegory for more queer issues as a whole that someone could connect to, rather than a very specific experience. The gems are a good idea. They're a stroke of genius. I don't think it's a coward's way out, it's a very creative solution that ends up serving a lot of thematic detail. LGBT representation is something that will be easily discarded if it risks cutting into the bottom line. And you know what? If that's your attitude, then more power to you. But don't pretend Steven Universe is some kind of pioneer. This is so disingenuous. There's literally not a cartoon to be more explicitly gay than Steven Universe before or after Steven Universe in the West. The amount of explicit and implicit themes and ideas, stories, personal experiences, all centering around different LGBTQ topics, it's crazy. Pretending that she's somehow putting it to the side and it's not doing enough, but also it's not doing it right enough. Uh, it's just like, once again, why do you choose to focus on this? One of the only things that's truly actually trying to do literally anything for gay people. And shit on it. Relentlessly. Whenever there's countless other shows, countless other material that is a better service of time if you actually care about LGBT issues. 
I mean, a lot of the reason I'm making this video is because queer issues really matter to me, and I want to see better queer representation and more pushback against bad rhetoric and blatantly incorrect statements. I also feel like I was lied to by these videos, because I watched the show and it was actually good, emotionally compelling, meaningful. I liked it! And then, a bunch of people on the internet who've never seen the show or who lie about things that actually happen in the show complain about animation errors and completely avoid everything to do with it. This is my making amends for going along with the crowd and believing the lies from 2016. The half measure, blink and you'll miss it representation isn't new. It's been a- Bruh. She just called Steven Universe half measure. Blink and you miss it representation. Do you think it's blink and you miss it representation when the entire reason that the Steven Universe hate train got off the ground is because of how much people hate gay people? Nearly the entirety of ER's video is either shifty things claiming lesbians are abusive people who serve bad relationships, or making arguments against the existence of trans people, or implying that if you acknowledge gender exists, you're a pedophile. That was the whole crux of ER's video. We watched it. We went through it. Obviously, it's not blink and you miss it. If conservatives felt so threatened by the show that they felt they needed to stomp it out, and what were the conservative complaints? Were they that the relationship between Pink Diamond and Pearl was a little abusive or abuse-coded in a way that was kind of problematic? No! Of course it wasn't! They didn't understand the show on that level. They just saw, oh, those two go by she, her, and they're raising a child. They're like lesbian parents. Disgusting. This is why I gave the preface I did before I started going into this video. Lily has found some things that they genuinely disagree with or dislike in the creative decisions of Steven Universe and how it deals with its LGBT characters, and decided because of these disagreements, it's valid to ride the hate wave of homophobia and transphobia all the way to the bank. Once again, it's been multiple years since this video came out, so this isn't an indictment of her as a current person. But, yeah, this video is awful. Around for over a decade, it's practically formulaic. The fact that people pretend this is in any way brave is fucking ridiculous. This isn't even getting into the complete middle finger that non-binary people get. Non-binary characters in Steven Universe exist entirely to avoid having to deal with the implications that many of Sugar's character designs create. Like how Stevani, despite being the fusion of both a boy and a girl, has their design very much leaning on the feminine end of the gender spectrum, might say something interesting about Steven, actually considering some choice moments in the first season when he says, but if it were me, I'd really want to be a giant. Nah, they're envy. That's just easier. Congratulations, Steven Universe. You've created a situation where a character being non-binary is the least interesting explanation you could offer. I don't know how on earth you managed to do that. That should be literally fucking impossible. Non-binary people are, by their very definition, interesting, and you managed to make that boring. Trying to climb a set of stairs and getting hit by a train. How'd you even do that? I... They didn't actually substantiate what makes this boring or, like, uninteresting. They, they didn't give, like, anything. They, they just said that the series maybe implies that Steven is trans, but then they decide to make him non-binary instead, which is less interesting. Uh, I think keeping him as a positive male rep, showing that boys can actually be more in touch with their sensitive sides, and it doesn't mean something inherently about their gender identity, is generally pretty straightforward and sensible, especially considering that by itself is already uncommon. Then you look at Connie. She's loyal, she's brave, she wields a weapon, she's a sword, she's a fighter. Connie represents more masculine traits as well. So having two characters who embody large aspects of the opposite stereotypical gender roles and then have them combined into something that's non-binary is pretty interesting. They themselves both lean on opposite ends of the spectrum while still assumably retaining their cis identity, but keeping these conflicting leanings mutually makes sense for Stefani. Speaking of which, the two characters who are presented as non-binary, Steven and Smoky Quartz, are both fusions. The only indication given that they're non-binary is that they use plural pronouns, which are common among non-binary people. But they're also fusions of multiple people, so it's highly likely that these two fusions don't even get to be their own person like other fusions do. Fusions don't get to be their own people. What? Okay, okay. So the way that they talked about Garnet earlier kind of had me wonder if they misunderstood this, or how they were referring to them as a character. Stefani is Steven and Connie, in the same way that Garnet is Ruby and Sapphire. They're not distinctly different. They're still their own person, but also not their own person. They're the representation of the relationship whenever they're in the same state of mind, when they agree with each other, when they're in step with each other, sometimes literally. I also think you could either see this as positive or negative, and I could hear arguments either way. The only indication being that they use they, them could be nice and casually normalizing it, but it could also be a little too underplayed and not really understood by younger audiences. I could see people arguing either way. 
There are also fusions of multiple people, so it's highly likely that these two fusions don't even get to be their own person like other fusions do. There's your bigger problem. Because of a quirk of language, I have no idea if these characters are actually singular non-binary entities or just a hive mind like a fucking Borg. So Lily's complaining about the English language here. She's complaining about not understanding if they're plural or singular because they're using they, them. That's kind of funny. I, I don't, do I need to have a response to that? I, I just think that's funny. Only tell would be how they refer to themselves in the first person. I wish you were here. If we were together, it would be okay. I hate you. I really do. Actually, a season five episode had Kevin explicitly refer to Stevani as they. So well done, Kevin. You were finally good for something. Better four years late than never. It's almost like somebody pointed out to Sugar that the information about Stevani being non-binary was only ever confirmed on Twitter, and that's not how storytelling works. Speaking of which, Stevani comes with their own host of issues. This show really pervs on Stevani every chance it can get. Despite them being androgynous, well, you know, according to Sugar, at least, Stevani is about as hard feminine as you can possibly how is that as hard feminine as you could possibly get? Is it definitely fem-leaning? Sure, but it's literally Connie's shirt plus Steven's shirt plus Steven's shorts, then Steven's hair, but long like Connie's, then literally a mixture of both of their faces. They have a little bit of curves outwards, but they don't have any notable cleavage. And in later episodes, they are growing facial hair. I think they fit very clearly somewhere in between of the non-binary spectrum. Saying they're hard fem-coded isn't necessarily wrong, but it also diminishes the amount of experiences that a non-binary person can have. The idea that you can't be non-binary unless you have like a glitter beard and eyelashes is completely out of date. Be you. Be who you want to be. Non-binary just means that you don't identify with male or female, that you feel somewhere in between, that you express yourself in some way in between. This doesn't have to be with outwards expression. This doesn't have to be with how you talk. The complaints that are being levied here could easily be levied towards actual non-binary people, and if they were, it would be transphobic. Yet, and the camera angles around them to get as many shots of their body as possible. <laughs> Did you see that hard sexuality? Look at the camera angle around them that's getting as many shots as you can. ...of their body as possible. Or Stevani is literally two kids in a trench coat. And this is a fact that's not- What is sexual about this? Looks like freaking Abracadaniel's stepsister. They don't even got a butt in this frame. Are they older looking? Yes, because it's combining all of the experiences of both Connie and of Steven. Meaning that the total amount of human experiences Stevani has is the combination of all of the years of Connie's life and all of the years of Steven's life. However, the things they've experienced are still that of kids, basically. So while they have increased mental faculties, they still are very naive about the world. They're the combination of Steven and Connie. Like, I don't want to give examples because I don't want to look like a weirdo, but if you're looking for characters that are represented sexually, whether they be female or underage or any number of things, look at nearly any other cartoon that's been put out, and it's probably more sexual than this. To give an example that has been specifically mentioned by Lily in this video, Katara is also 14 years old, and she's consistently drawn with more detail, more curves, more whatever. In fact, if I remember right, there's even like a few swimsuit scenes where Aang like blushes and freaks out and stuff when they're like in the river or something. Once again, if you've seen Avatar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So them choosing to be upset about the Stevani rep, which once again, look at this. Look, look at this. Is this too sexual? Is this perving on the ca- Look at, look at what's on the screen. <laughs> look at this. This is nothing. If we are going to surrender to this level of delusional Puritan panic, we won't be able to make any art at all. This is a double standard that is never applied to any other cartoon to the level it is with Steven Universe. And the only thing that sets Steven Universe apart is the fact that it's queer. Casually ignored by the writers, in their debut episode, Stevani is creeped on by some skeezy f but the moment their fusion destabilizes, this happens. <laughs> That's two kids! I'm out. Okay, <laughs> great. Well done, Kevin. You passed the basic minimum requirement of a human being. Here's your mediocre trophy. <laughs> Except Kevin and Stevani have another encounter in the episode Beach City Drift. And not only does Kevin remember that Stevani has two kids fused, he continues to hit on them. Your whole two kids in a beautiful trench coat routine won't fool me this time, so don't even try it. I know you want to be close, but this is a little clingy. Uh. Kevin is literally hitting on two kids and is aware of that fact. The episode portrays him as a bog-standard creep that literally every woman on the planet has met at least once in their lives, but Kevin's disturbing behavior goes a lot deeper than that, and none of the writers notice or seem to care. And I'm not surprised that's the case. The show aggressively sexualizes Stevani nearly every time they appear, and the con- Aggressively sexualizes. Have you seen any aggressive sexualization in this video so far? Also, earlier, Lily said that Kevin is unfairly stigmatized and treated meanly. Why is she now saying that the writers aren't treating him bad enough? 
He was literally the only other example next to Jasper that Lily provided for people who are unfairly scrutinized. Pick a side! If you make this many logical contradictions in your two-hour critique of this show, I don't think that you're in a great place of standing to actually critique the show. Consistent and ever-present fact that their two kids' views together is repeatedly acknowledged and simultaneously ignored. When the writers want to- Is this- is this overtly sexual? Is this- is this terribly sexual? Why? Is that- because there's a slight hip. You got, the, you got the slight hip. You got the slight hip. You got the no cleavage, no butt, no anything. You, you got the slight hip inward turn. Objectification of bodies, both of and under age, are a horrible issue in the industry. Something consistently seen. This is one of the worst examples that you could possibly give. Ooh, so subversive stunt, the fact that this is Steven and Connie is loudly placed front and center. When the writers want to gawk at Stevani's ass- Lily just replayed the same shot from a second ago because there's so little content that even barely approaches showing them in any way resembling this. Never seem to acknowledge it. Also, Stevani is apparently 26. What a- well, look at this thing! Look at- <laughs> Look at them! Look at them! Seriously, if you look at this and you go, This is simply too sexual for the children. Then you are officially more Puritan than a 1920s parent. It's because that's Stephen Connie's age is fused. Are you shitting me? That's the kind of excuse I'd expect to see in a bad anime, sugar. Look at them. Look at the, does this, does this, does this strike fear into your heart? Does this make you go, oh my gosh, why are they so sexual? No. What? Any normal person does not look at this and immediately think, wow, they're really being sexualized. They have hips. Actually, that brings me to the big question. Why do two small children create a conventionally attractive woman when they fuse? Out of all the fusion designs dragged from the bowels of the world's cra- It's the only fusion with two humans. Craziest acid trip. This landmark fusion of a human and a gem creates a rather generic looking woman as a result- What? It's literally- just a 50-50 combination of Connie and Steven. Connie's hair length and general color. Steven's curls. They've got Steven's shirt and shorts. And earlier on, they have Connie's dress. Their face is even a mixture of Steven's face and Connie's face. What do you mean bland human woman character? I'm wondering if Lily even looked at these episodes whenever she was editing it, or like while she was editing it, if she didn't think to herself, Hmm, I'm like over exaggerating an extreme amount. I really hope that nobody watches the video when they listen to it because th this is ridiculous. Adults. And let's not forget, these are children. Putting aside just how sleazy it is to do this with children, children are some of the most imaginative little shits in the world. If any fusion should have four arms, six eyes, and a venom spitting cobra for an ass, it's- All the other fusions are fusions of gems. Steven fuses with his dad in the movie, and guess what it makes? It makes a fusion of Steven and his dad. It's pretty much a perfect mixture of things that they're both interested in, both get along with, and also mirrors physical attributes of both of them. Same thing with Stevani. Stevani, but no, it's just generic pretty lady. If I had to hazard a guess based on the rest of the decisions in the show, I think should- <laughs> Generic pretty lady. Seriously. Look at this. What possible character could you be thinking of? That you think this is just like a casual roster. Have you seen th the only head I can think of that fits the head shape of Stevani is Abracadaniel and Abracadaniel from Adventure Time. Literally the only character with this freaking head shape. And even then, the outfit, body, etc., everything, having big, long, poofy, curly hair, that's not like a generic woman choice. It's so weird. It's such a very... Very weird complaint to take. Or develop the look of Stevani first, and then tried to find a way to cram them <laughs> into the story somehow, and simply didn't consider the implications of Stevani's very existence and the way they're often framed and sexualized. The fact that this is two children often being gawked at by the camera just This is children being gawked at by the Are they just okay. What assumption could I possibly make about Lily for them to think for some reason this is so sexual? Is it the fact that they have their bare feet exposed? Is Lily just really into hips? They never show cleavage. They never wear anything shorter than, like, typical shorts. Most of the time, they have multiple layers on. We don't even know for sure what genitals they have. It's such- it's like, this level of puritanism would, like, give a 1920s parent a stroke. Didn't occur to anybody. I mean, that's the optimistic reading. The cynical reading is that Sugar's obsession with anime has taken a toll on her psychological well-being. The hasty addition of Stephen and Connie's ages after the fact seems to lean hard in that direction. Not gonna lie. That's just racist. Implying that a person being interested in another culture's art 
somehow inherently would lean them to being more pedophilic in the way that they're operating is racist. Sugar talked about her supposed intent behind Stevani, and it reads like this. Stevani challenges gender norms as an individual, but also serves as a metaphor for all the terrifying firsts in a first relationship, and what it feels like to hit puberty and suddenly find yourself with the body of an adult. How quickly that happens, how it feels to have new power over people, or to suddenly find yourself objectified, all for seemingly no reason, since you're still just you. And they are still just them. They're Steven and Connie, who you already know and relate to. And if you do, you can feel, for this episode, what those feelings are like. Yeah, that's a difficult part of puberty. As your body starts to change and people start to look at you in a different way, people desire different things from you. Obviously, this is an experience that more women deal with than men, since men tend to be more proactive. And by that same ticket, a little more creepy. But yeah, this is a very typical thing that a lot of people experience. Placing them in a situation where they're having to deal with one aspect of growing up is really important. Especially when the show was originally made for some kids, and by the time that this episode came out, the show had actually been going for a while would leave one to think that a lot of the original intended audience of the show would probably be going through puberty themselves at this point in time, and so this is something that would maybe be specifically useful to those fans of the show. Okay, first of all, that's not how puberty works, you fucking idiot! You don't just suddenly have the body of an adult, you develop it over time! No 14, 15, or 16 year old has a fully developed body, that's just a stupid idea people have from teenagers being played by grown-ass adults on TV! You wanna showcase puberty? Give Stevani a cracked voice and acne! Ugh. That's what fucking puberty is like! But that wouldn't be conventionally attractive, now would it? Second of all, your best way to demonstrate being objectified is to literally fucking objectify Stevani? That's your best excuse? Holy fucking, this isn't a metaphor! This is just being the thing! Sugar, you are such a fucking creep! Overreaction of the century. <laughs> so this whole thing was hinging on them being objectified, and I don't know if Lily just thought we would look at the screen and go, Yep, that's pretty objectified to me! Uh, or what, but it just seems like such an out-of-hat over-exaggeration, considering how much more tame this is than virtually any cartoon I grew up with. And also, why did it make them so angry to talk about the change between puberty and adulthood? Obviously, you're gonna have different changes happening over time in puberty, but experiencing the sudden changes in your body versus experiencing the sudden objectification you feel are two different narrative issues to cover, and it does make a lot more sense if you're trying to portray feeling like a child but being treated like an adult to put two children in a more adult body. That's just a, like, very straightforward logical line of thought. Yeah, as much as this is probably the height of the video and how exciting it is, it's really, like, unwarranted. There is one more thing, though, and that's Ruby and Sapphire's wedding. After coming apart from the revelation that Rose was Pink Diamond the entire time, they wander around apart for a bit with Ruby turning into a cowgirl? I like the tiny red lesbian, but I don't understand the tiny red lesbian. When they finally make up, Ruby asks Sapphire to marry her, and we get the first on-screen same-sex wedding in a children's show. I don't have much to say about it. I'm just pointing out the one actual tiny milestone Steven Universe has. Tiny milestone. Gay marriage just was legalized nationally in the US, and they managed to get this into the show after Rebecca insisted for a long time and fought super hard to get it. And since then, I'm not sure if we've gotten that again. That's not a tiny thing. That's a huge thing. Well done on that front, Steven Universe. Here's your tiny trophy. I look forward to the day a good show does this and we can all collectively forget about you. When a show comes along that you like much better, you still won't be able to throw it out. Because it was the hard-fought battles that Steven Universe did in order to pave the way for this representation that will permanently put it on the historical record for how people were able to represent queer characters in children's cartoons. As I stated at the beginning of this, Lily has left a comment on the video saying she no longer stands by the racism segment, so I'm actually going to be skipping over much of this. I actually do find some of the criticism from the uh, document that she links fairly compelling, especially regarding some of the criticism towards actually my favorite fusion, Sardonyx. But there is one thing that I want to reiterate, as she ends up really digging into Rebecca in this segment, if I remember correctly. But something that I really think is important is, Rebecca gets a lot of criticism for specifically this fusion and everything, when the person who storyboarded the episode and actually made it was Ian Jones Cordy. So not only was Steven Universe worked on by an extremely diverse cast of people, but this specific episode, this specific fusion design, all of this was done and storyboarded by a black man. So, what is Rebecca Sugar supposed to do? I know that they were the top lead person, you know, they were the head honcho, so to speak, but do you really expect or blame Rebecca for not going over to a black person and telling them, you are writing about your culture wrong? Do you really expect them to say, all right, I'm bringing the hammer down, you don't know how to talk about black people. 
That would be insane if Rebecca did that. To my understanding, the people who worked on the show generally talked about these things and came to collective decisions and understanding, while still sometimes having disagreements, obviously. But completely ignoring the fact that what is seen as bad black coding was also created by a black artist is a strange omission that I think actively characterizes Rebecca in a really malicious and wrong way. They don't stand by these anymore, but just in case people didn't know, no, Rebecca didn't write this storyboard. Yeah, she approved it, but what's she gonna do? Deny a black person from writing about their own culture and experiences? From presenting characters as they choose to? That seems way more problematic to me. I also think that it was an extreme over-exaggeration to really go in on the human zoo as some sort of racism thing, because, yeah, the idea of subjugating people as a class for entertainment is, like, a very easy, obvious concept that's existed in every form through all of human history. Just because something evil happens doesn't mean that you can't artistically engage with a very similar idea. The idea of having an idyllic society, or having humans kept in a cage like pets or animals, is something that's been done millions and millions of times over by endless science fiction stories. Which, I mean, Steven Universe is a space science fiction alien story about these oppressive aliens who see humans as pets. Yeah, it makes sense that they would create a human zoo out of a misunderstanding. I don't know. I didn't ever think of race even once while I was watching this episode. And I understand, to an extent, that's because of my lack of awareness and knowledge. But I also think that it is something that is consistently revisited as a science fiction concept, and we shouldn't ban the entire artistic trade of this vague concept just because horrible people did something vaguely similar in the past. I also think the fact that people would dig into this as some clear malicious racism when it's just a really common science fiction trope is kind of bad faith. Okay, let's get into this. So, The Pink Diamond Arc. This has got to be the most erratically written story arc in the entire series, and seemingly came right out of nowhere as a bomb to drop onto everything. Sugar clearly imagined this being a shocking twist that completely blindsided everyone and changed the entire dynamic of the series. And it did, but not in the way Sugar intended. Earlier in the video, she complained about this being the most obvious thing that was guessed immediately, so why was it a giant bomb that shocked everyone? If a large contingent of the fanbase actively thought that this was the route it was going from season 1, then I don't really know how those two statements can be true. Diamond Arc ultimately took every single scrap of potential the series might have had and completely tore it to pieces. Every possible bad decision you could have made was made, and a lot of character growth was completely negated by this story. So about halfway through the series, right after Bismuth in fact, we're introduced to the idea that Rose Quartz kicked off the war by shattering Pink Diamond, the leader of Earth's colony at the time. Steven spends a while agonizing about this, and the rest of the gems all just accept it as a reality of war. This is something of a hard-hitting moment for Steven, as he literally just got done telling Bismuth that shattering gems was the worst thing in the world to do, even worse than death, apparently, and now he has to contend with the fact that his mother shattered Pink Diamond. Okay, a piece of information fundamentally alters the way Steven has to think about his mother and his own narrow view of what's moral. Well done, Sugar, that was very interesting. There was a lot of discussion about whether or not it was a good or bad story thread, with a lot of people pointing out the raging hypocrisy of Bismuth having immediately precluded this. Yeah, see, it's not a raging... You just explained how it was an active part of his character arc, so how is that a raging hypocrisy? If anything, it's more so that the story is actively sending Steven multiple trials to test his general preconceptions. And from this, we start seeing the unquestioned fealty from Steven and the Gems actually start to falter and change until they eventually realize that they don't exactly like Rose Quartz, or they don't respect or think that she was operating purely in good faith. They feel a little hurt, a little manipulated. They don't agree with her decisions, but they have to live with them. A very real scenario. I once again have to stress, Bismuth was actively trying to murder Steven. Kill him! Murder him! That's not good! Steven would have to deal with that guilt, and in that briefest of glimpses in mindful education, it looked like he was at least torn over this. So what happened? Sugar kept fucking with it, that's what happened. Come the trial, this previously earth-shattering revelation becomes the catalyst for a murder mystery block completely out of f***ing nowhere. Steven turns himself into Homeworld to face judgment for killing Pink Diamond, and his lawyer comes to the conclusion, based entirely off of Steven's lack of Rose's memories, that Rose couldn't have shattered Pink Diamond and then proceeds to go through the security measures that had to have been in place during the war. The lawyer then assumes that the only person who could have killed Pink Diamond would be someone who Pink Diamond wouldn't have thought twice about trusting, and who had the authority to cover it up afterward. This revelation, and Yellow Diamond's reaction to it, made a lot of people suspect that it was Yellow Diamond who killed Pink Diamond as a means to push the other diamonds into using the corrupting light. A suspicion that, on reflection, would have been a much better plot point. Little happened as snippets of Pink Diamond's life were given in flashbacks until- Hey, did you see that? Did you see that tiny little bit there? Happened as- Hey, you see this? Look, Stevani having facial hair, and also the hair is shorter and tied up. 
and wearing this jacket. Not sexualized at all, and also, undebatably, fairly non-binary looking. I mean, even if you think they have a more femme appearance, there's plenty of guys that also look like this. Snippets of Pink Diamond's life were given in flashbacks until a single pale rose, where it was revealed that Rose was Pink Diamond the entire time and had a change of heart about Earth because flowers before deciding to give it to the Crystal Gems. So that's a bit disingenuous, of course. Lily knows that she didn't change her mind because of flowers. Perhaps by complete comedic accident, flowers also do end up allegorically representing something very similar to why she does defend Earth. Pink Diamond vanished, took up the mantle of Rose Quartz, and started her revolution, right? No, no, that would make sense, but no. That would make Pink Diamond experience a moment of growth in realizing how terrible and regressive her sister's way of governing is and make her the flawed but sympathetic character Sugar wants her to be, and we can't have that. What actually happened was that Pink Diamond started the war and pulled the strings on both sides of it like Emperor f***ing Palpatine before deciding to fake her own death and live as Rose Quartz forever so she can be free of her responsibilities as a diamond and have an exciting fresh start with Pearl. You know, the plot of Kingdom Hearts is less needlessly complicated than this. A Rose Quartz isn't exactly a high-class gem to be turning into for the rest of your life. Giving up the identity as Pink Diamond essentially gives up all of her prestige and perceived power and place in society. She becomes just one of them in the eyes of anyone who sees her. And it's not like she scuttles off and hides by herself. She realizes that if she wants to save Earth, she still has to do this war. It's definitely messy, but it's not like it doesn't make sense. Steven Universe has a big problem in that a lot of the characters who are designated heroes are some of the most vile, despicable creatures I've ever had the misfortune of spending time with. Lapis willfully allows her impulses to dominate her and is borderline abusive to everyone except Steven. Yeah, Lapis definitely has some pretty dominant character flaws. Amethyst is a perpetual sulk who seems to view self-improvement as some kind of admission of weakness. Except coming to accept her faults and see herself as not just the weak link or the burden on everyone is part of her major character arc and something that she ends up fully concluding as we talked about earlier. It's absolutely insane. Pearl is insane. Great argument. Great argument. He's self-righteous idiot with no awareness of his surroundings whatsoever. I mean, his lack of awareness, his naivete, is definitely one of the endearing traits that's intentionally put in there as a character flaw and something that can endear you to the audience, especially children and especially people who don't know what's going on in the story can hold a candle to Pink Diamond. Pink Diamond is a character who was born into a privileged, idyllic life, demanded more than she rightfully deserved on the basis that her status demanded it, realized the responsibility was more than she could chew, and decided to bail out on it so she could live a life of relaxation and laziness. What? So Lily's argument, and the argument of many that I've seen since, is that the Diamonds are Nazis. So how are you going to characterize someone deciding, hmm, I don't want to be a Nazi, as them being lazy? Do you really think orchestrating and starting and winning an entire war is going to be less work, less effort, less pain than just keeping with the status quo? And while she was born into this privileged identity, the fact that she changed herself to something unidentifiable to that original identity to the point where nobody knew except for Pearl virtually strips her of that entire privilege on a presentation basis for the rest of her life. Doing so, she completely the minds of the oppressed gems, manipulated them into starting a war against her own people, pulled the strings long enough- Do you really think it was manipulating them? Her own people? See, like, what's with this nationalistic language? I thought that you were supposed to be a left-leaning critique. They're fascists. She's fighting against the fascists. She's not manipulating them. She's saying, hey, you guys don't like being literal slaves to fascists, do you? Join me in a fight for your freedom. How do you possibly consider yourself left-leaning and frame this situation as going against your own people? Like, it doesn't matter if you're going against your own people if your own people are evil. The fact that you share the same nation, the same country, the same species, the same race, it doesn't matter. What matters is you as a person standing up for what's right. And what's right is not exterminating life on thousands of planets. Something that Lily agrees with. That's why she hates the diamonds. But whenever Rose goes against the diamonds, no, it has to be turning against her own people. This is showing something that's going to end up being very hypocritical later whenever she starts tearing into the diamonds. ...on that war until she'd had her fun and then faked her own death, which had a profoundly traumatic impact on the gems that were still loyal to her and her sister diamonds. She was born into wealth, got bored, f***ed with people for a laugh, toyed with her emotions endlessly, and then proceeded to continue doing all of that as Rose for thousands of years afterward. I mean, she definitely did mess with people's feelings, that's for sure. R.I.P. Pearl, you know, R.I.P. Pearl, but... This is a horrible, horrible, bad faith interpretation if anyone has ever seen one. First episode upon returning from hiatus was Pearl telling her own version of Rose's story, which once again is completely disconnected from everything else we know about Rose and is clearly set up to make her look like just a precious small bab. And then one episode later, Amethyst reminds everyone that Pearl is not an unbiased party. I honestly do not know what Sugar is trying to do here. I don't know. She's trying to build a complex character who has different interpretations of her actions based on the perspectives of the different people. It's letting people understand that sometimes when you're told something about someone, it doesn't have to be absolute truth. That sometimes people have different biases and opinions. The fact that Amethyst, one episode later, literally states this, as you mention, 
should make it pretty obvious. And I do think a lesson about not listening to 100% of what you hear about people could be important for children, especially whenever they're told that certain people might be good, whenever they might actually be abusive know what kind of character Rose is supposed to be. She's so erratically characterized, repeatedly rewritten, and seemingly draws new personalities out of nowhere that trying to get a bead on what Sugar is trying to achieve with Rose is almost an impossible task. You know, I would also say I'm pretty erratically written. When I'm talking to my roommates, versus when I'm talking to my girlfriend, versus when I'm talking to my parents, versus when I used to go to church, you know, that's a completely different person. You know, I don't know, seems kind of erratically written to me. Maybe it's just I was presenting different sides of my personality that are all parts of the central me at one time. There's a through line of motive that can still be ascertained from all these different perspectives. The different perspectives aren't even necessarily false, but it is clear that our perception and relationship with different people causes people to look differently to us. I mean, that's literally Risei's entire arc in Persona 4. Watch my P4 analysis series. Truth of Sugar's writing. She's going entirely with what she thinks might be the most subversive choices, regardless of whether or not they contradict each other. So desperate for people to think her writing is smart that she has completely abandoned telling an engaging story in favor of setting up another shocking twist. See, like, this is projection. She has no evidence whatsoever of any of Rebecca's motives. All she knows is the reasonings Rebecca gave. She's assuming every single possible negative, cruel, awful thing about Rebecca with no real reason in order to characterize her as this evil villain. Most of this video is literally just constructing a narrative with the few points that she has about how Rebecca is secretly an evil person. Which is like really weird if you're trying to do a critique of the show, because if you want to paint someone as bad, show me the bad actions they do. Don't go to a piece of media they made and then extrapolate negative things you feel about them from random things in the show. It ends up making this feel more so a look at the show in order to make a hit piece about the creator. Rose Quartz had her entire character hacked up to pieces to achieve that goal. Now, I can already hear you angrily typing out your comments that, well, actually, Sugar intended this to be the revelation from the very beginning and laid out all the hints. It was hinted at from the very start. And I'm gonna stop you right there and say, no, it wasn't. She is with you. The only indication we have that Sugar planned this Rose's Pink Diamond twist out from the very start is that Sugar said she did, and Cartoon Network released a compilation of all the clues throughout the series. You literally said earlier in your own video people were guessing this, like, basically from the start. And I don't know, as someone who binged the whole series back to back, I didn't see it as some crazy revelation. Pink Diamond disappeared at the same time that Rose Quartz showed up? That seems kind of sus. How did they manage to kill a diamond when we know diamonds are so strong? Why is Steven so powerful in so many unique ways? I don't know, there's, there's a lot of obvious hints that I feel like somebody could put together. It's not rocket science. So I'm gonna spoil a writer's trick for everyone. You see, if you wanna have a twist, but you don't know what that twist is going to be, you can lay clues throughout a series that are so vague, you can warp them to retroactively mean whatever you want. You're exploiting hindsight bias to trick people into thinking your writing is smarter than it actually is. In the case of this compilation that Cartoon Network so proudly displayed, many of their own clues don't imply that Rose's Pink Diamond, even in hindsight. I mean, I haven't seen Cartoon Network's own clues. All I know is I watched the series back to back and it didn't seem like that crazy or unreasonable of a revelation. They imply that Rose had secrets. What those secrets were are not in any way implied. They're so vague and open-ended that it could mean Rose was Pink Diamond, it could mean she was secretly Jehovah. Pearl silencing herself. The show explicitly saying that she had secrets is a way of further pushing this idea that people aren't always what they seem. That you shouldn't just trust someone based on one person's word or opinion or perspective, that you should come to know and understand and gather an opinion on someone yourself, because otherwise you could make yourself susceptible to abuse if that person's not being honest with the people that they're around. Making this a family member, specifically the own mother of Steven, also is very impactful, considering when you look at domestic and sexual abuse of children, most of the time it comes from family members in the home. This inadvertently ends up being a really useful life lesson for kids to learn in a children's show. Something that could theoretically actually guard them against abuse. It means that Rose ordered her to keep a secret. It doesn't imply what that secret was. Again, it could mean that Rose is pink diamond. It could also mean that Rose liked to force Pearl to random people for a larf. Those aren't hints that Rose is Pink Diamond, they're hints that thing. something happened. A something that was vague enough so as to technically fit once Sugar actually decided what it was. And the audience is so desperate for this show to be smart and mature and challenging that they lapped it up. If you are a fan of Steven Universe still watching this video and you think this shit was clever, you got scammed. Nah, I didn't get scammed. I watched a pretty good show with lots of good music and uh, some nice emotional beats and I enjoyed myself. I didn't get scammed because you decided that you didn't want to play along. This is like if I'm playing a game with a bunch of people, and then Lily comes up into the circle and says, No! You can't play this game! It's not fun! And I'm like, I don't know, I'm having fun? I, are you having fun? And then all the people in the circle are like, Yeah, we're having fun. Yeah. And they're like, Stop! Stop it! No! It's... 
You can't have fun. This is fundamentally an unfun game. You've been scammed into thinking it's fun. And then I'm like, no, no, I think it's fun, actually. No, it's pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. But my point here isn't purely the stop having fun meme. It's also that the reasoning that Lily has given has obviously been extremely bad faith and manipulative in the way that she's framed this. She's tried to make a huge narrative arc of a real-life person, Rebecca, as this evil villain based on extremely tertiary, small, and underwhelming problematic aspects of the show. Revelation didn't just hack up Rose's character, it also hacked up Pearl. Pearl at this point was already a contentious character, but at the very least she was compelling. A member of a race of gems literally bred to be slaves, but turning on her masters and becoming her own gem. That was the saving grace of Pearl. While the yellow and blue pearls were subservient and devoted to the point of being scary, Pearl was the odd one out by being her own person. Well, guess what? She's not. She was Pink Diamond's Pearl and continued serving her with utmost devotion even after Pink Diamond faked her death. She was just as devoted to her diamond as the other pearls and arguably even more so because she was secretly lusting after her, and it's unknown if the other pearls do so as well. I hope I don't need to point out how intentionally manipulative literally every choice of words being made here is. It's reframing everything in a way that's sort of like a half-truth from like a metaphorical perspective, but also in a literal sense sounds really bad. She's not lusting after her literally because fusion isn't sex, having admiration, loving, or supporting someone, but I do think there's something significant in being told to be your own person, actively choosing to stand by that person as they change from the person that you knew, and deciding to fight for them of your own right and own will. Could we make conjecture about how Pearl would be if she would stand by Pink Diamond if she wouldn't? Maybe, but if we're assuming that Rose Quartz manipulated the other gems to start the war with her, then why would we suggest that Pearl was completely absent from this same level of manipulation? Pink Diamond didn't want Pearl to serve them as a servant. They wanted Pearl to live their own life and be free, and if they chose not to, then to serve them of their own right, will, and want. All of this is being completely left out, like not even mentioned in this video, which is super manipulative. Went from being Dobby to being Winky. The talk about being her own gem was a lie. The renegade Pearl was a lie. Pearl proudly saying she belongs to no one was a lie. This entire arc revealed a really nasty undercurrent within Steven Universe and goes along with the rest of the series. Slavery is a very real thing among Homeworld, and Pearls are seemingly bred to be slaves and nothing else. So why did Rose turn against her own people? <laughs> You just, I don't know, see, like, once again, see, like, you were just criticizing Rose Quartz for turning against their own people, and then you're like, yeah, slavery is real on Homeworld. Okay, well, if premise one is true, then premise two should be fine. At one point, a ruby soldier gleefully remarks that they might give her her own pearl for killing Rose Quartz. What does Steven Universe have to say about that? Nothing. This goes unremarked on except by Peridot in one episode and Bismuth in another. Outside of that, it never gets a passing mention. It seemingly exists in It goes unremarked upon, except for the fact that it's a major plot beat that defines one of the main characters of the show, and is also actively challenged by racial bias by two different characters throughout the show. I don't know. I feel like that's a decent amount of mentioning entirely so Pearl can have a triumphant moment in her fight with Peridot and is then just lying there afterward. Worst off, Pearl's one-sided lust for Rose turns from a vector for her to deal with grief into something unbelievably gross and twisted. Pearl is now a slave harboring romantic feelings for her master, and given the behavior of gems like Jasper, Holly Blue, and Peridot before her defection, it's safe to assume that this kind of devotion and adoration for a diamond is commonplace and possibly encouraged. The diamonds are the ones who make and shape gems. Are you really gonna tell me they wouldn't program their servants with obsessive attachment to keep them loyal? Lily stumbles onto an accidentally good comparison there. The gems, in their power and ability, are very similar to gods. They literally create life. Because of that, and given the society, it's hard not to fall into this cult-like admiration. Yes, for the most part it's partially consensual, but it's consensual based on the fact that they really haven't had the time or right to have alternate perspectives in order to challenge their opinions. When Pink Diamond decides that she doesn't like this unquestioned fealty that's given to the diamonds, this unwarranted level of respect based purely on their fascist power, Pink Diamond starts telling people that they can be their own selves and that there's more to the world than just serving the diamonds. But I grew up with this stuff. I used to study this stuff in college. I wouldn't exactly say the slave master to god creation argument exactly fits here, even if it buys into some of the explicit imagery in the Bible. Imagine you grew up in a small church community where everyone served their idea of God and the person who told them about God was through this pastor. Now imagine one day this pastor has come to the conclusion that they don't believe anymore, and they decide on the pulpit to present the things that have made them not believe, before encouraging some of them to go on with them and leave the church community. Is anyone who decides to follow this pastor just a slave? No. Would I say that the pastor themselves were the slave master? No. And also that's really insensitive from a at least American racial perspective. Lily's mixing up the extreme language she's using for multiple different metaphors, to end up demonstrating aspects of her analogy that don't actually make sense. 
what kind of problematic Pandora's box you open with this, almost every aspect of Pearl is tainted by this almost pitiable undercurrent. It's almost impossible to know if anything she does or feels is genuine, or even if she feels at all. Where does diamond programming end and a personality begin? This would all be things that a good writer would consider, but Sugar is so blinded by a desire to be subversive that she just carelessly leaves all of this out in the open. Since the explicit thesis of the series is that we all have a right to do what we want to do, but sometimes we don't realize the biases that drive us to do certain things, and multiple arcs are spent getting rid of this sort of racist, essentialist mindset, like with Peridot, it's pretty obvious where Sugar lands on this whole situation. The question of how much of Pearl is still being programmed is mostly sort of interesting only as a sort of fanfic or dark interpretation. It's very clear that for logical reasons she has decided to serve Rose Quartz, and also has valid reasons for admiring her from her own perspective. The way that you see Pearl treat Greg whenever she's briefly reset in the Steven Universe movie shows how different of a person Pearl actually is from the original Pearl state to the Pearl that we've known and loved. There's no question about it. Pearl's her own person, but still, based on her own life experiences, she decided to side with Rose Quartz aspect of Pearl's existing to be slaves was never a part of the series until it became the reason Peridot is dismissive of her and was ignored after that because we already had our climax. It's no surprise that Steven Universe has nothing to say about homeworld slavery when it was only established to give an excuse to punch Peridot. How can you say it was never acknowledged after that, whenever just previously you mentioned that Bismuth mentions it, which is in an episode after this? In the conversation between Pearl and Pink Diamond in the flashback, Pink Diamond is talking to Pearl as if they're BFFs and not literally a master and slave. That whole dynamic between the Diamonds and their Pearls has just been completely forgotten about. Oh, oh wait! Cause we're still not done! You remember the human zoo? Before we knew about Rose, Pink Diamond had a zoo where she kept humans because she thought they were cute. And after her death, Blue Diamond continued running it in her memory, something that Yellow Diamond views with absolute contempt. There's even a whole cut of Rose Quartz gems being kept bubbled in her chambers because during the war, the Diamonds didn't want Rose hiding in plain sight. After the reveal that Rose is Pink Diamond, the human zoo was rewritten to actually have been run by Yellow and Blue Diamond the entire time to placate Pink's worry that the colony is destroying the humans. The human zoo was a huge black mark on Pink Diamond's character. When a single pale Rose released, everyone was pointing to the human zoo as a glaring issue being left out of Rose. Rose's story. It's odd to just accept something the villains say uncritically, and then later, whenever it's given more nuance, say that it was a rewrite or mark on Pink Diamond's character. Are we really supposed to trust the evil people that Pink Diamond wanted this exactly? It makes way more sense that Blue Diamond, knowing that Pink loved the people, decided to make a small memoriam with these weird pet-like organic beings and put them into this little chamber. Because once again, the difference between gems and humans isn't just a superficial one. Gems live for thousands and thousands of years, while humans live for like a hundred if they're lucky. It's actually an extra bit of info that really goes far to characterize just how much Blue Diamond cared while also not understanding at all what Pink Diamond was going through. Which fits, because Blue Diamond represents emotion and Yellow Diamond represents logic. Yellow Diamond thinks the human zoo is a waste because what's the point of setting up a memorial for someone who's gone? Blue Diamond wants the memorial without taking the time to understand and logically think through if she would actually want that or not. It further characterizes Blue and Yellow in an accurate way while also demonstrating the way that they failed in their relationship towards Pink did what she always does and retconned it so Pink Diamond wasn't responsible. This goes alongside the overwhelming attempts to characterize you just heard the thorough explanation of how this fits perfectly with all of the characters involved. Why is it a retcon? This is something we faced in the previous videos when talking about Cheeseburger Backpack and the test. A retcon isn't whenever you gain more context to a situation and are able to perceive it differently, it's when something that's an undisputed fact is then taken out of the story without explanation. Putting Chekhov's gun in a drawer earlier in a movie, and then randomly never mentioning it again whenever it becomes relevant, is a story inconsistency. But explaining that someone stole the gun out of the drawer whenever it becomes relevant is just nuance. Steven Universe isn't 170 separate stories that constantly retcon every time a piece of new information comes. Steven Universe is a 170 episode long story that overarcs a general characterization. Are there two mutually exclusive, completely true claims that logically contradict each other in this situation? No. Then it's not a retcon. This isn't like J.K. Rowling completely removing the time turners in book 4 of Harry Potter. This is Rebecca presenting a concept through the lens of the villain and then showing greater context through the lens of other people that further characterizes all of the people involved. This is good character writing. Diamond is a diamond with no real authority, to wash Rose's hands of all responsibility for the Diamond Authority's sins. Sugar wrote herself into a corner with Rose, and rather than just abandon this stupid red herring of a plot, she just started taking the white out to the story like a Republican senator on the Confederate Wikipedia page. 
If Sugar accepted that, regardless of how well-intentioned Pink Diamond might have been, that her upbringing and comfortable position of privilege had instilled in her a warped sense of what's moral and just rolled with that, then Pink Diamond might have actually been an interesting character whose entire existence didn't constantly piss everyone off. If we had a Pink Diamond that cared about humanity, cared about the Crystal Gems, and cared about them being able to live their own lives, but was still ruthless and cold-hearted in her tactics on top of that, we wouldn't have to keep writing this spirograph of a plot to explain away half the things she does, because the audience would have already been on board with the idea that Pink Diamond is not a good person, and they could have laid out a far more consistent and less nonsensical plot. In fact, this wouldn't have even needed to go as far as Pink Diamond. They could have just stuck with Rose Shattered Pink Diamond as a revelation, and that would have actually been more interesting, and in my case, would have made me like her a lot more. Because having her stand up and own it and shout, Burn it! is a lot more satisfying than some wishy-washy bullshit to clean the blood off her hands. This is why I exclusively write characters like this, because it's just more satisfying when characters own their ruthlessness. This weird moral purity where, despite starting a war for their own freedom, characters are supposed to remain true to their virtues 100% and never kill, despite the fact that it's a war is one of those weird fandom attitudes that showcases just how sheltered and stupid a person is. It's not a weird fandom attitude, it's a show made for 8 to 12 year olds that's supposed to introduce them to nuanced issues in reality in a way that they can begin to engage with. At later points in life, once they've internalized stuff like, hey, maybe don't get violent off the bat, try to see if there's another solution, then they can start to see the situations where there isn't a solution. But kids, by default, don't go to wishful thinking and trying to find a solution, they go to violence. Because in a lot of cases, might makes right is the most Neanderthal straightforward point. If a kid steals another's toy by punching them or pushing them on the ground, that makes a lot more sense than trying to reason with them because kids aren't exactly good at reasoning. Trying to imbue the idea that there are other solutions or that things are more complex or that people aren't purely evil just because they're evil is really important in understanding the nuance of the actual world we live in. Because even if there are people who are evil, there's a lot more people who are misguided, wrong, or just not very good. Thou shalt not kill if thou art protagonist rule set by both creators and fan communities is complete and total nonsense. If Sugar had the guts to write Rose less like Twilight and more like Sylvanas, this show probably If Rebecca, in writing this children's show, just had the guts to not write their character like My Little Pony and more like World of Warcraft, it's a kid's show. That doesn't mean that the writing should be less quality, but it does mean whenever you lean on life lessons, it should maybe lean towards what should generally be your first course of solution rather than an extremely nuanced exception. It would have been closer to earning its reputation as an important and meaningful work of animation. The problem is that for all her claims otherwise, Sugar really wants people to think of Pink Diamond as a good person, but that was an overwhelming failure because Sugar didn't bother to address any of the shit that contradicted that view of Pink Diamond. This isn't true. They don't want you to look at Rose Quartz as a good person, they want you to look at her as a morally gray character that, depending on the perspectives of different people, you can understand why some people liked her, why what she was doing was somewhat noble, but also how she wasn't perfect in those aims. She was a nuanced, multi-layered person that you don't quite understand fully, something that's accurate of most real people, something that's important for kids to internalize. When they have a good impression of someone, or when they have a bad impression of someone, there's often more sides to the story than the one that they're seeing. Seeking empathy and understanding is generally a good virtue for kids to try to learn. The thing that needed to be addressed or dealt with was ignored when it mattered the most, and too many characters are too willing to just accept it without question. Rose isn't- Oh, and also, none of the characters accept it without question. I know this is prior to the movie and future, but it's pretty explicit that all of them feel wishy-washy and weird about the whole thing with Pink Diamond and Rose. And Garnet is completely heartbroken by the revelation. It leads to her split up in season 5. Steven even takes down the picture of his mom in future because he's uncertain about how to feel about her, and that he wants to live and be his own person and try to make amends for some of the things that she did. Because while he agrees with the general idea of people being free and living how they want, he doesn't agree with a lot of the decisions that his mom made. The whole Steven Universe movie is literally him fighting against a problem his mom created that he had no part in. The entire story throughout the series is supposed to be about Rose being placed on a pedestal by biased parties, but Sugar doesn't want to actually take her down from that pedestal, which is why we only ever hear about Rose from those biased parties. Anything bad she does is doused in a thousand asterisks, and Sugar can't bring herself to actually commit to any single idea for Rose. And also there's this. Alright, let's rip the bandage off. Rebecca Sugar has a very weird relationship with fascism. Quasi-fascist villains are common in animation, especially children's animation, but in most cases, the things that make fascism such a vile ideology are often casually hand-waved away. There are very rare instances where these issues are openly presented, such as arthouse films like Schindler's List and The Pianist. Steven Universe is one of those rare instances. The main antagonist of the series, the Great Diamond- Steven Universe, just like Schindler's List and The Pianist. The Pianist goes hard, by the way. That's an awesome movie.
Diamond Authority showcases every last one of the traits I listed above. The diamonds have convinced the other gems that diamonds are perfect and without flaws, unlike other gems in the Empire. At one point, despite being literally built to be tech experts, Yellow Diamond explicitly shouts that the puny thoughts of a Peridot are beneath her. Garnet's first appearance before other gems was considered to be so abhorrent that Blue Diamond ordered that she be immediately killed. They literally keep people as slaves, and they have shattered millions of gems and are cooking them in a combination mass grave and weapon of mass destruction. Just look at this scene of Steven and Peridot emerging into the cluster's chamber. They're looking onto literally millions of bodies. That's pretty fucking direct for a children's show. So the diamonds are about as Nazi as you can get without having them do a ridiculous salute. My diamond. Peridot reporting in. Actually, never mind. They have that too. Okay, so Steven Universe is pulling absolutely no punches in its portrayal of fascism. Salute doesn't equal Nazi. Salute equals military. Yes, those Venn diagrams overlap some, but there's more mutually exclusive examples than there are inclusive ones. All in all, one of the interesting reasons the gyms serve as a good metaphorical vehicle with dealing with general issues about queerness and difference in society is the fact that unlike humans, they actually are fundamentally different. Peridots of the second generation don't have certain powers. Lapises control water, Laramares control ice. Depending on the gym type, they have different powers, and diamonds are, objectively, more powerful than any of the other gems. So whenever they take on these more fascist presentations, the fantasy elements of the ways that gyms operate actively throw a wrench in this sort of allegory. For example, there is some loose visual connection between a giant mass weapon and a bunch of gems being forcibly cobbled together to make it. But that's not how bombs work. Bombs kill lots of people. Bombs aren't made of lots of people. Those people that are put into the bomb aren't actively making the choice and also still alive. There's a lot of very noteworthy changes that are made that keep you from making a very strict and black and white parallel to our real world. That's because you're not meant to see it as one possible interpretation, but as a lot of different ways of viewing these character arcs and personalities in a greater context. The idea of being your own self, coming to your own conclusions, being an individual, understanding yourself, and not always trusting the people around you, even if you've come to love them, is a really important thing to learn. This cult-like mentality is the exact issue that the gyms fall into, that because of some logical basis, they have to be subservient, when in actuality, it doesn't matter. Looking at this from a queer perspective, you see a lot of far-right religious types make the observation that homosexuality can't reproduce children, so the experience of their relationship is inherently degenerate, lesser, illogical, unnatural. But we know in the wild that there are homosexual relationships among basically all species. And the lesson here is, it doesn't matter if I can't do everything that you can do, if I choose to live my own life and do things that make sense to me, that make me happy while guiding my own life, then that should be something respected. It's supposed to fight back against the idea that even if someone can do something that you can't, that you still have equal value as a person and that you can live life proudly and happily in the way that you want. By all means, second-generation peridots are considered disabled compared to first-generation due to the amount of mining and lack of care given to them. Because of this, most of them are born without powers or with extremely little powers and have to use technology as an aid to help them with their tasks. Despite this, Peridot is still one of the best people on the crew. Her experiences as a gym, as a person, are still equally valid to anyone else in the story just because she doesn't have magic powers to shapeshift all the time or whatever. This is the more logical underlying analogy. Unfortunately, when you seek to depict characters that happen to hold beliefs that are unfortunately common enough to face in real life, Depicting those people with power and with the logical conclusion of their beliefs often resembles fascism in its imagery. But when writing the stories of queer people, what exactly is the thing that queer people fight against? It's under a lack of understanding, a lack of empathy, a lack of willingness to realize them as equal people. And while there is a fascist lean with the characters, there's also a lot of things that don't resemble our real life that are substantially important. Because if you truly think that the Diamonds and the Nazis are actually 100% equivalent, then you are admitting to the premise that the Nazis believed, that some races are lesser than another. Rather than misreading the story as, Ah yes, Rebecca, the bisexual, non-binary Jew, agrees with the Nazis, you think to yourself, Oh, yeah, maybe the lesson is that they are wrong. Maybe the lesson is that fascist thinking is wrong. The issue is, Lily has an hour and 42 minutes to build up to this narrative after character assassinating Rebecca on basically no terms whatsoever. So by the time that you get to this video, if you've been watching it in one setting, you've either clicked off, written a comment that Lily deletes, or you've eventually given in to her narrative. 
That's more bold than any cartoon would ever have the balls to do. There's just one problem. Rebecca Sugar isn't actually aware that she's done this. The show isn't about fascism. The rebellion that Rose started against Homeworld had nothing to do with their fascist police state. It was about protecting nature from the damage a colony creates. When we actually do see the diamonds in person, their entire persona is begging the viewer to feel pity for them. Blue Diamond is constantly grieving over the loss of her sister. Yellow Diamond is angrily compensating for her own grief. Pink Diamond is like some white hippie who just wants to lay on the beach, get high, and fuck Earth guys. When it comes time to actually talk about the diamonds, none of the above things I listed get so much as a passing nod. In fact, when Steven finally learns about his real identity as Pink Diamond, he regards the other diamonds as family in spite of knowing full well that Blue Diamond tried to murder the closest thing to an actual mother he's ever had and shattered enough gems to create a massive artificial fusion. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention the artificial fusion that horrified Garnet so much it brought her to tears and almost destabilized her. By the way, it's only his identity as Pink Diamond that keeps Steven and the Crystal Gems safe. The diamonds are shown to be so strong that with a single finger, they can crush gems. What is Steven supposed to logically do here? As a pipsqueak, half-diamond, half-human, with like six gym buddies, how are they supposed to take down two of the three most powerful things in all of existence? This isn't a JRPG. This is a battle they will lose. And by some absolute miracle, if they don't completely lose, most of them will die. Otherwise, it would be seen as bad writing because it would have completely rewritten and undermined the strength of the diamonds, which would have completely destabilized the entire way that the show operates. So what's the only other way to write the situation? Obviously, to continue with the theme of empathy and understanding and trying to get the diamonds to give them a chance. The big change that happens here with the diamonds is the thing that they thought to be true about Pink Diamond being dead wasn't even true. So for them, this makes the entire war unjustified, and Pink Diamond being the one to cause the war also, in their mind, absolves the other gems of their wrongdoing. It follows a very clear-cut logical through-line. Prove he was Pink Diamond, he and the others would have been killed in this episode. This is, once again, something that goes unacknowledged by the show, and it's creepy as all Sugar spends the majority of the latter half of the series woobifying space fascists to a disturbing degree. There's no hook to any of this. If you're looking for one, there isn't. You know the corrupting light that turned the majority of the crystal gems into bestial monsters? The diamonds didn't know it would do that. They just thought it would obliterate them. And Homeworld were the aggressors in that war too, by the way. And the diamonds are overwhelmingly portrayed as sympathetic, with the dissonance of their very real and unfiltered fascism just completely ignored or hand-waved as made some mistakes. And I know what you're thinking, oh, Lily, you're reading too much into things. You're reaching for allegory with the none. Okay, how about a one-to-one -one modern day explicit depiction then? Because the episode Gem Harvest strongly featured Steven's xenophobic Uncle Andy, whose beliefs are so thoroughly strawman Republican that I think I last saw him in a Wolfenstein game. The episode in which he features in has him thoroughly spit on Steven's actual family, rage about their non-standard relationships, throw a conniption over the fact that Greg is letting Lapis and Peridot live in the barn, and generally behave about as pleasant as a catheter filled with wasps, only for Steven to then deliberately insist that everyone make up because they're family, and for Uncle Andy to see absolutely no consequences for his horrible behavior. And the diamonds are that times a thousand. So, yeah, I do agree. It's kind of cringe. It's tepid liberal civility context, let's all get along, whatever. I agree. However, as Steven, who is still a child, and as a kid watching the show of Steven dealing with this, this is pretty much a one-to-one -one example of what a kid needs to do in a situation if they're at a family gathering with a more opinionated or hateful family member. Because a kid in those family scenarios don't have the choice to say, get out, or you're not allowed here, or anything like that. Instead, the best they can do is either avoid the person entirely, or actively try to change their mind to make things more pleasant for everyone else. After all, kids have a soft spot for a lot of these characters. The same thing happens with his uncle. Even if his uncle disagrees with a lot of the other things, he still sees something personally in Steven. It's shown that the most effective way to fight racism, homophobia, transphobia, etc., is literally by just introducing one person of that minority type into the life of someone who is hateful. A whole gobble of studies have been done over this. The most effective, quick way to change someone's biases isn't to give them huge logical arguments, even though that's generally what works for me. Instead, it's literally just to desensitize them to the fears, make them realize on their own through seeing these normal, natural people that actually it is okay. And so, for a person with no power, such as a child in a family situation, the best way to do that is just by insisting positively and hoping that they'll change their mind. There's a strange forgetfulness and spite towards the hopeful, idyllic nature of Steven Universe that seems to feel spite towards the fact that it's a kid's show. I think kids' television should have high writing quality. Having bad writing quality is never an excuse for a kid's show. However, I do think it's important that you understand the morals you're teaching kids on a very fundamental level if you're going to make a kid's show. You can't make a kid's show where the lesson of the story is sometimes people are just evil and you need to kill them, because 
I mean, that's laughable. Why would anyone make the argument that's okay? But that's what Lily wants here, and actively complains about repeatedly, despite it being ridiculous. This doesn't just reflect badly on Sugar as a writer, it reflects badly on her as a person. To so thoroughly depict a fascist regime with a disturbing amount of accuracy, only to then turn around and insist that they're just misunderstood babs that need a hug, just... Okay, throughout this video, I've made multiple attempts to attribute Sugar's writing to overwhelming writing flaws like tunnel vision, or wanting to have a story both ways, or trying to do literally everything and it's just not working out the way she hoped. I do that because people get really touchy if you start directly insulting someone on a basis other than the merits of their work, and I- You have insulted them repeatedly. I would not- uh, If you've been holding back so far, you've been doing a very bad job. I've probably cut out most of the insults you've given to Rebecca along the way because they haven't even been points. They've just been unsubstantiated little jabs. I try to at least give people as little reason to strawman me as I possibly can, even though they're going to do it anyway. Hi, Gamer Gazi. And that's why I've been taking this video basically point for point. I don't want anyone to get a misunderstanding about what context Lily said this in, or how they said it, or how it's taken. I don't want to give a summary of points that make up a two hour long video. I want to go by thoroughly and explain how all of these points were either minor, tepid criticisms, or just not good. Let's hope I don't also get straw manned. I've, I've actually been terrified to make this video because I'm afraid of the harassment that I'll get from Lily or ER or whatever. Plus, I don't even know if this will be monetized. Really, I'm basically shooting myself in the foot by making this video at all. But I just feel a injustice in the world. I felt like I was lied to for multiple years, and I crapped on a few of my friends for liking Steven Universe based purely on the lies that I was told in these multiple videos. After seeing the show and realizing I liked it, it was like a sudden moment where I was like, oh crap, I messed up. So this is me making amends. After writing all that out and reading through it and thinking about it, I can't say anything else but, God, what a piece of shit. Just a, a thoroughly loathsome person. I mean, obviously this show meant something at some point, and I've clearly been passionate about it, otherwise I wouldn't have been taking it apart for 50 pages. And I know Sugar has her deep admirers, but I fucking think the woman's terrible. I know I made a big show about how I hate Lars and his stupid face and his stupid hair and his stupid square skull and his stupid- I love Lars. Lars is so funny. He's such a- Steven! Stop talking to me, Steven! <laughs> I love- I love Lars. He's so unbearable, but it's hilarious. ...with earlobeless ears that make him look like a Sobeys bag. But real talk, that's just dumb shit that only bugs me. This- this is f***ing gross- I love Lars. <laughs> I wonder how many of these I love Lars moments I'm gonna cut out of the actual video. <laughs> ...at every possible level. This kind of, nobody reached out to me and now I feel abandoned and sad, is the exact kind of attitude the alt-right likes to gaslight people with in real life. In one episode, Sugar told kids that killing a Nazi makes you a Nazi, and then in another, she told kids that Nazis just made some mistakes and that they're totally forgivable. You can't get past what that says about you. Yeah, Sugar is very much oblivious to all of this crap, and she seriously thinks she's writing down-to-earth, relatable people. And I get the feeling that if she was watching this video, or someone laid out all this shit to her, she'd sit back and have a, what have I done moment. And if that ends up being the case, Rebecca intentionally wrote a fantasy story that used the fantasy race of gems as an allegory for the relationships that people have, the different perspectives, life stories, and opinions that people hold, and then created a war between people who think we should all be the same and people who think we have a right to be different and live as we want. From this basic structure of people who desire order and nothing other than what is most efficient for some greater nebulous cause, versus people who want to live their own lives and do the things that make them the most happy, this general contempt is the underlying through line that underpins the queer struggle. This dehumanizing, this lack of seriousness, this insistence that our love is somehow less worth respect. Because people come from all different types of queer struggle, and also different non-queer minorities fighting different types of struggles. It uses its story as a more generalized metaphor to explore these struggles and lessons, ending with things that are affirming to children who are maybe going through these issues and are not accepted in their own lives, and giving them the tools to deal with people who might not understand. Whether that be your old racist uncle that has to come to family gatherings and you don't have a say in it, or whether that be some bully at school who just doesn't understand. The downside of making an allegory and metaphor system so broad is that you can bad faith interpret it as something dark and evil. You know all those videos that got popular a few years ago about the dark truth of Rugrats or something, and they're like, they're actually dead babies, but they're trapped in the afterlife, reliving their purgatory. You know, like all those stories? That's what Lily has done with Steven Universe here. 
except instead of posing it as some dark interpretation that kind of makes sense, whoa, that's so crazy, instead she's facing it as completely serious and calling the creator, who was one of the first people to ever succeed in pushing an explicitly queer narrative, a horrible person. Once again, I hope Lily has grown substantially in these last four years, but this video is awful. Case now, or a year down the line, or five years down the line, then great, but that's not relevant to the here and now. You know, I get it. Redeeming villains is such a trend these days, and some people seem to think it's a really good idea. Sugar clearly thinks so too. Sugar wants to make a world where redemption is always a possibility, and where everyone can get a second chance. But my question is, if that's the road you want to take, then why are the stakes so Hi. Why is it that every time this story comes up, it's always the people who are hell-bent on destroying everything? Because for a children's show, you have to make things very black and white and clear. You don't want people to accidentally side with the wrong people. <sighs> Redemption, always the most nasty, vile creatures imaginable. The movie had this directly contrasted. The villain who dies is a jovial doof, and the one who gets redeemed is far more nasty and vindictive. In Steven Universe, the villains that don't get redeemed are, well, fun Saturday morning cartoon villains. Aquamarine, Malachite, Holly Blue. Aquamarine mentioned! <laughs> this is the first time in any of the three videos Aquamarine's even mentioned. How are these fun Saturday morning cartoons? This character was described by ER as a Nazi guard. And this one from the first episode has a gem that gets actively recovered and is the first one to be saved. Because it's seen as not their fault. Malachite is just a combination of Jasper and Lapis. Literally nothing until it's time for the boss fight. But when it's time to hand out redemption arcs, it's the fascists and the abusers who get first. Bottom, 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 bottom. The abusers shows lapis. Pick. They're the ones who get the second chances. They're the ones who have to be extended a hand. And there's no reason for it to be this way. There's no reason why redemption and forgiveness has to be lashed to such monstrous people. If Sugar wanted redemption to be a core element of the series, why aren't the antagonists just domestic problems? People who have personally wronged you or who have been an uncomfortable presence in your life. Things that are relatively small in the grand scheme of things. Sugar loves- I thought you were calling that guy a pedo earlier. Now you're saying again that you- Was this written in multiple different segments? like over a course of a long period of time and you just forgot some of the things you said? Because at the beginning of the video, you said that he was unfairly maligned and given cruel treatment by the show. But then the middle part, you acknowledge that he's like kind of creepy, like possibly a little bit yikesy in terms of like acknowledging that Stevani is technically two kids in a trench coat. But then now you're saying that, yeah, they should forgive him, man. It's a minor domestic thing. What? Beach City so much she spends half the show there, but when it's time to talk about forgiveness, suddenly it's time to turn to the Galactic Empire? My question is always the same. Why them? Why the Diamonds? Why Rose? Why Lapis? Why Andy? Lars, Ronaldo, hell even Kevin are all sitting there with infinitely less horrific baggage that you could easily write a satisfying and far more impactful redemption arc. Where what? <laughs> Lars gets a full redemption arc. What are you talking about? They actually earn that forgiveness and wouldn't reflect so badly on Sugar. And in all my years of asking that question, be it the Diamonds or Starlight or whoever the terrorist getting a redemption is this week nobody's ever been able to answer why they had to be this extreme forgive and forget is a strange lesson because it's not universal it's meant to be kept to trivial issues of someone hurting you either accidentally or through ignorance it's applicable to kids who get their feelings hurt by other kids the problem is that this lesson reverses itself as you grow up war abuse genocide these things cannot and should not be forgiven forgiveness does not work in these circumstances it's not an absolute it only works in a tiny number of cases the problem is that steven i forgive you lily i don't hold anything specifically awful over your head. I don't insist that you have bad intentions or had bad intentions, and I don't insist that you can't grow as a person. And I wouldn't consider what you did here with this video a minor thing, at least in the way that you're describing it. According to you, maybe I shouldn't forgive you for grifting on an alt-right hate wave movement towards one of the most impactful queer shows created in order to make thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, I don't know if this is demonetized, but a two hour long video with 8.5 million views, I would dare to guess you made at least $20,000 off of this. I would say that's no small beans. Instead of using your experience and standing up to this obvious bad faith grift, you decided to jump on along with the other major voices, the people comparing minorities to fried chicken buckets, plastering a Jewish creator's face over a Nazi soldier's uniform, making jokes about the creators being monkeys or having ugly teeth, this unilateral attempt to crush Steven Universe as one of the only noteworthy pieces of queer media actively pushing for acceptance and rights of those marginalized communities. And then to jump on that 
and crush it with your boot as hard as you could. If you're saying we should never forgive, no one should forgive you for this video or ever see you as an advocate for anything left-wing. But obviously I disagree with your premise. I think your characterization of the show is completely wrong, and I think this is multiple years old, and that you can or already have grown as a person and realized just how much of a mess this video was. That despite the damage it's done, there's always a chance that people can change, or that people can use their platforms to do good. That people aren't solely just black and white, evil, or good. Something to think on. The universe is about war. It's about abuse. It's about genocide. It's about the things that cannot and should not be forgiven, and yet it insists on doing them anyway. The show Recess isn't about a group of friends. It isn't about people hanging out on Recess. It's actually about a secret purgatory of delinquent kids that are actually- Even Universe is that mother who tells her daughter, Oh, that boy pulled your hair because he likes you, tacitly teaching them that affection is shown through violence. And to those of you rolling your eyes at all this and readying your- Affection- <laughs> Tacitly teaching them affection is shown through violence. They don't think the gyms were doing anything out of love. They were doing something bad. Something that Steven never forgives them for and instead sentences them to an entire eternity of fixing their mistakes. I mean, let's look at this from a pragmatic point of view as well. Thousands and thousands of gems have been either corrupted or actively shattered. The only people in the world with the ability to fix this are the diamonds. Should we A, kill the diamonds and say screw all those people? Or use the diamonds, force them, for the rest of all of eternity basically, to fix their mistakes? One shard at a time. It seems like from a pragmatic perspective that makes more sense. It seems like from a productive perspective that makes more sense. And it seems like from an empathetic perspective it makes more sense. And I'm not saying empathy towards the diamonds. I mean empathy towards the thousands of people that if you kill the diamonds, you're going to keep shattered. People like to forget that the diamonds don't get off scot-free. Their entire life purpose becomes fixing all of their mistakes methodically for the rest of time your knee-jerk comments and Reddit posts about how Oh, well, it's just a kid's show, so of course they're gonna do this. I'd like to ask why so many of our favorite kid shows growing up didn't do this. Maybe we can make some big pots of glue, and then I can use glue bending to stick his arms and legs together so he can't bend anymore. Yeah, then you can show him his baby pictures and all those happy memories will make him good again. Do you really think that would work? No. <sighs> Look, except for Avatar did do that. Aang takes away Ozai's powers and puts him in a jail cell. He doesn't kill Ozai. Did you just forget the end of Avatar? Did you forget the end of literally the only example that you've provided as a positive counter to Steven Universe? Aang doesn't kill Ozai. He gets rid of his firebending and puts him in a jail cell. In fact, if we look at the punishments that both of them are carried out, Ozai basically just has to rot in a cell for a long time, while the gems have to spend possibly thousands of years actively fixing every single mistake that they've ever done. Steven's punishment is harsher in some regard, and they didn't kill the gems, they shattered them. Ozai actively killed tons and tons of families and people. This was a really bad example. Did you just forget the ending to Avatar? This shit's important whether you like it or not. You know it is, otherwise you wouldn't have been flocking to Steven Universe as this mature show that challenges kids, or as IGN calls it, this generation's Avatar. Fucking Christ. Ah, uh, that's why. Okay, this is this is a joke, but I think it's funny to just imagine that the actual reason that Lily jumped on this was she saw this title, really liked Avatar, and was like, that's it. <laughs> this show is an Avatar. I'm gonna prove it. It's like if I made like an hour and a half long hate video on Hollow Knight because somebody compared it to Dark Souls. Hollow Knight is an amazing game. I love Hollow Knight. It's one of my favorite games of all time, but it's not Dark Souls. <laughs> I can see why this would get under their skin, though, considering the only positive example they've ever given in this whole video is vague allusions to Avatar. It kind of comes full circle. For some reason, it, this, it just makes me think that this is why they wrote the video. Uh, at least that would be a funny reason to think. And you wouldn't be watching a web series where all cartoons are the most serious of business all the time. We can't cry foul about childish remakes, sloppy animation, imaginary rage about CalArts style and mysterious mare duels, and then write off the entire thing as just kids shows when the subject of the criticism makes us feel uncomfortable. We can't keep dragging up the fact that Rebecca Sugar is a non-binary half-Jewish woman every time this particular criticism is dragged up as if that means it's impossible for her to be afflicted with the stupid virus. That it doesn't mean that it's impossible for them to be inflicted with the stupid virus, but it does mean maybe you should reconsider your extremely bad faith and obviously inconsistent worldview, and instead ask if instead there's something more likely about Rebecca as a person.
you saying people pointing out the fact that Rebecca is a non-binary, bisexual, Jewish person isn't actually a refutation to that. And the people bringing up that aspect of their identity is also not just idpol in its particular usage. Because the implications of implying that a Jewish writer is positively writing about Nazis is really screwed up and needs some serious substantiation and logical arguments made. An accusation that extreme needs some serious substantiation. And your arguments against the queer representation in the show was literally we should kowtow to conservatives because they'll get mad at us if we don't tell our stories the way they like. This video is far more malicious in actively serving the things you claim to be against and claim Rebecca is doing than anything Rebecca has done in this show. That doesn't change the fact that Sugar still did this shit and remains unaware of just how f***ing gross it really is. I'm disturbed by Rebecca Sugar's insistence on pushing redemption arcs onto the most vile creatures and begging her audience to consider their feelings. I'm disgusted by this level of on principle writing that insists that redemption is always the best regardless of the circumstances. I'm disappointed in Rebecca Sugar for not being able to grasp a simple concept that children have no trouble grappling with, and I'm ashamed to watch so many people write off these glaring issues as it's a kid's show, as if teaching kids to be forgiving of this kind of horrific behavior is anything other than abhorrent and irresponsible. Well, that's because your interpretation of this behavior is taken with the context of something that isn't actually what it's trying to allude to, but is instead what you are seeing it alluding to as someone who has already researched and studied these topics. A child who sees this show, obviously not being aware of intense historical events, is instead going to see these characters in their own family, in the bullies at school, in different people they meet in their own domestic day-to-day. -day. And those people in a child's life are going to feel like astronomical, huge changes, powerful beings who can change their life forever. I mean, kids have no power in the realm of adults. The only way a child sees this show and interprets it the way that you think that they will is if for some reason you're sitting down children and teaching them about the long-studied history about all of these crazy historical events and the way that they very loosely apply to these certain metaphors. There's not a single kid on the planet who's gonna watch the Human Zoo episode and be like, Wait, they put humans in real zoos back in the 1850s? This is so screwed up. It's a parody. It's a joke. It's not an argument. Let's get down to the bare bones of this since I know this is what everyone is going to be quote mining. Do I think Rebecca Sugar is a fascist sympathizer? No, says the diamond, I mean Rebecca Sugar. No, says the diamond, I mean Rebecca Sugar. No, says the diamond, I mean Rebecca Sugar. Do I blame anybody who comes to the conclusion that she is based on Steven Universe's content? No. I maintain that Rebecca Sugar remains completely unaware of the implications of her writing because she's just not paying attention outside of her very specific goals, says the diamond, I mean Rebecca Sugar. A lot of people, not just her, fail to grasp that forgiveness does not apply everywhere. A lot of people will hand wave atrocities if it means getting their villain redemptions. Many people on the political left actually bought the GOP's bullshit about economic anxiety. That doesn't make them fascists. The diamonds are the latest in an idiot cliche that began with characters like Starlight Glimmer. Sugar was just dumb enough to include the fact that they have corrupted millions of gems while trying to kill them all and slain millions more. Sugar was dumb enough to include a scene where the main characters walk across literally millions of bodies. Sugar was dumb enough to push for redemption despite all of that. Okay, millions of bodies. So obviously I've debunked everything they've said here, I'm just kind of letting them talk. But the millions of bodies thing is particularly malicious because millions of bodies implies it's dead bodies, except for all of the different pieces of gems are actually still alive in the cluster. They're still actively able to speak and communicate and eventually be healed by the diamonds eventually because that's the task that they've taken up to systematically fix everything that they've done over time. I think the core problem is that, like many adult cartoon fans, Sugar is just profoundly f***ing stupid. However, it is not my or anybody else's job to hold her hand through her own myopia. If someone calls Sugar a fascist because of what they saw in Steven Universe, then that is a rod she created for her own damn back. She made the decision to give the diamonds a galaxy-wide body count and then spend an extreme amount of time talking about how sad they are. And every attempt to address this since has just been to shift the blame onto somebody else. See, it wasn't their fault. It was all White Diamond. They were only following order. Wait. Part of being a creator is accepting that the conclusions people draw from your work are your responsibility. Yes, people can make wildly bad reads of your work, but unless you can fully explain why their read of your work is bad, then you're responsible for it. This is something I disagree with that I think is actually really anti-art. What do you mean if someone makes a bad faith reading of your work and you're not able to debunk them, then you're responsible for their bad opinions? This is just Lily trying to skirt the responsibility of all of the horrible stuff that came to them after the video was made. 
If you put something out in the public, it doesn't matter how well you wrote it, the fact that flowery language, metaphors, analogies, etc. exist, and people will always come into things understanding different things in different contexts and different time periods, there's literally never a time in history where you can release any single piece of art and it not be misinterpreted, even in good faith, by thousands and thousands of people. Artists are not responsible for every misinterpretation that people make of their work. Artists are responsible for trying to make something that can't easily be interpreted as that, but I also think that if you were to ask a 12-year-old Steven Universe fan what they thought of the Holocaust, they would respond with, what are you talking about? The target demographic, the target audience, has a 0% chance of walking away with the lessons the way that Lily has described it, and Rebecca is not personally responsible to respond to Lily's video so that Rebecca doesn't get harassed anymore. This is an unambiguously abusive mindset to say that creators, artists, people who put things out into the world, create beauty, are responsible to their critics, and if they can't actively debunk every one of the thousands of misinterpretations, then they are responsible for every bad thing that someone takes from it. This is anti-art. This is anti-human. But more than anything, this is dumb. Uger realizes this considering she addressed concrete so directly, but everything else she is suspiciously quiet about. It's a writing lesson I learned the very hard way. If you set out to give one idea in your work, and through ineptitude, accidentally give the opposite impression, you should accept the responsibility for that and refuse to stand by that work, and fix it by either rewriting it or disassociating yourself from it. If you can't do that bare minimum, then you will simply reap what you sow. One of the most common defenses of Steven Universe's frankly bizarre philosophical bent is to just ignore that it even has it. One poster on Gamer Gazi said in response to Bismuth as usual, Oh, it's just a kid's show. It doesn't need to get bogged down in real-world ideology. But I'm not the one bringing real-world ideology into Steven Universe. It did that to itself. 90% of the series' lore is about the rebellion against a fascist empire. That is inherently political, and not just in the way that all are- 90%? Really? 90% of the show is that? That's not true at all. Art is political. Steven Universe gleefully stews in political subtext. One of the characters is a walking beacon of non-traditional identities whose mere existence was considered so abhorrent that it warranted a death sentence. Steven Universe was a show about big ideas. Fascism, rebellion, LGBT rights and pride, trauma, the necessity of violence, disabilities, individuality, personal freedom, unrequited love, grief, loss, holy shit, they just kept coming. But while Sugar could have a lot of ideas, she couldn't deliver on any of them. She repeatedly portrayed her fascist villains as sad and sympathetic, failing to understand that while sympathetic villains are good ideas in theory, in practice they only work under very specific circumstances, and this was not one of them. Her approach to trauma, grief, abuse, and loss was to continuously let them dominate your life, make I can't no believe that they wrote something so dark into this show. This is disgusting. I can't believe she didn't realize how vicious this scene looks and not consider different. Peridot looking mildly uncomfortable, while Lapis looks fairly upset, grabbing her shoulder. The bright blue- <laughs> The bright blue sky! <laughs> I- <laughs> Every time they, every time, every time she shows this clip again, I just think back to how overdramatic this whole video is. <laughs> it's so vicious that she would dare make a scene like this and not realize what she was doing. Peridot looking like, oh man, they didn't have fries at McDonald's today. And Lapis being like, I can't believe that someone talked behind my back with the sunny, beautiful sky in the background. <laughs> Feel <laughs> yourself and actively resist any attempt to help you because that's the only way she knows how to create drama. Her approach to the necessity of violence was to claim that it was never the answer and brand the only character who didn't follow that philosophy as evil, which is wrong at every possible scale of resolution. I know it seems like I've been harsh on Sugar, but in reality, I have been- Yes! You have been more harsh on Sugar than nearly anyone has been in nearly any cartoon in history. You look at Avatar, which is far more realistic, a lot less cartoony. It tries to present itself as a more real world rather than a cartoon world that has fundamentally the same, if not an even less extreme, conclusion to its main villain, and you taught it as something positive while assuming the worst faith possible for every single little thing that Rebecca did been extremely lenient. The cynical explanation for all of these problems is that Rebecca Sugar doesn't care about the impact these themes might have, and that she actually might sympathize with a lot of the more nasty ideas presented in the show. That the reason the Crystal Gems don't bother taking the fight to Homeworld is because Sugar doesn't consider this kind of naked fascism to be a problem worth dealing with. That the See, so this is also very manipulative. Lily's like, people are gonna quote mine me, so I want to clarify my opinion. No, I don't think that Rebecca's a fascist. And then say, now, Another interpretation people could have to explain this is, she is a fascist. This feels really scummy and gaslighty, to be honest.
The reason slavery is treated like no big deal is because Sugar doesn't care about it. That the reason characters never get help for their crippling issues is because Sugar is only exploiting these things for cheap and easy drama. But what I think is the actual- <laughs> The re- <laughs> Rebecca Sugar doesn't care about slavery. Do you believe that? Does anyone actually believe that? Does anyone sit down, watch Steven Universe, come out of it going, mm, yeah, I think that Rebecca has an extreme ambivalence towards the idea of servitude. It's a joke opinion. It's a joke opinion to hold. The problem is that Sugar and the rest of the crew have severe and crippling tunnel vision. This is why the implications of, say, the human zoo aren't addressed, because the human zoo only exists so the crew can shove in as many 70s and 80s sci-fi designs and hippie love in as possible and fuck everything else, and Sugar wanted to do a prison break episode. That's why it never occurs to anybody to free the Zoomans, because that's not part of the story Sugar wanted and she just didn't bother to consider the implications. Characters display impressive abilities or insight in one episode which vanish in another because they might get in the way of the story going exactly where Sugar wants it to go. Whenever the story reaches a roadblock, Sugar just deletes it. Ideas are crammed in and then discarded almost immediately. Sugar wants to do everything in Steven Universe. She wants the villains to be space Nazis so they can be intimidating and menacing, but she also wants to have sympathetic villains, which bad writers translate as, I'm sad, feel bad for me, and doesn't bother to consider that those two don't mesh. The I do think that Lily's conclusion here does a really good job of wrapping up all of the points over the two-hour video, which is somewhat impressive in its own right. You just have to remember that literally every single one of these points are wrong in a way that is very clearly and easily able to be dismantled. Higher Pink Diamond Arc was written because Sugar wanted her shocking twist. The way in which it so thoroughly pisses on everything that's come before it didn't matter to her. The twist was all that mattered. It's very reminiscent of how fanfiction is written, going with literally every idea you come up with and no regard toward whether it actually fits in the story. Subverting tropes purely for the sake of subverting tropes, going with the idea that shocking twists and vague mysteries are good purely on principle and not taking execution into effect. Sugar writes like someone who has never written before or even taken a basic writing class. And that makes sense, because she's not a writer, she's an artist. And based on how Steven Universe is animated, she's a bad artist. It's like now, like, what's, what are you possibly getting out of the personal jab of saying Rebecca Sugar's a bad artist? Like, you're not a writer, you're an artist, and based on how badly written Steven Universe is, you're a bad artist? Like, it's just mean. Like, it doesn't even serve a point or a narrative that Lily has about Rebecca. It's, it's just mean. It's just being mean to Rebecca for no further greater purpose. No adherence to a height chart. No tertiary thing that Tumblr thinks will magically fix Steven Universe will actually fix Steven Universe. These are not the disease. These are symptoms of the disease. Rebecca Sugar is the disease. Steven Universe doesn't have a writing staff. Like, what? <laughs> Calling Rebecca Sugar a disease. Calling someone a disease. In general. Calling anyone a disease as a person is unbelievably terrible, but also, unironically, fascist language used against the Jews. Rebecca, as Lily is acknowledged, is Jewish. Calling a Jewish person a disease. Like, even if you hate them, even if you think they're despicable, if you want to beat the bad faith allegations, maybe don't throw out anti-Semitic allegories in your insults. Because as an artist, Rebecca Sugar doesn't respect writers enough to hire any, keeping all the responsibility for plot details and story structure on the storyboard team. Steven Universe's animation is so frequently warping itself beyond all reason and causing characters to constantly change size because Rebecca Sugar is too lazy to organize the material she needs to keep things under control. Steven Universe's themes are constantly whiplashing back and forth into extremely problematic territory every other week because Rebecca Sugar just doesn't give enough of a shit to check her own work before sending it off. Steven Universe- Or more so, whenever you create a generalized metaphor that can be applied to multiple situations, it's often that one of those possible interpretations could be taken in bad faith, and a bad faith interpretation of any metaphor can lead to bad logical conclusions. You can't look at things as single statements, you have to look at them in the full body of their work. What is the overall trending message that is being presented here? And without a doubt, consistently, that message is empathy and understanding. This attention focused on a single plot idea without becoming immediately distracted because Rebecca Sugar has no organizational skills whatsoever and will chase the next butterfly that passes her desk. In essence, Rebecca Sugar- like Lily's just insulting them. They're not saying anything about the show. This is just ripping into them. Sugar is all the worst aspects of Lauren Faust, David Cage, Stephen Moffat, and Seth MacFarlane all rolled into one person, and then given the reins on a show with an unusual amount of production time and creative control, and nobody to rein in her worst habits. Not everyone is cut out to be an executive producer or showrunner, no matter how good their ideas might be. But in this age of demanding that all creators be allowed to do whatever they want with zero oversight, Steven Universe is exhibit A of why we don't actually do that. Why creators have to answer to studios or networks who will have to be associated with whatever next comes spilling out of your mouth. When so, weirdly... Weirdly pro-corporate all of a sudden? This, this is why artists should never be allowed to make their own stories?
and should always answer to studio heads and executive producers because artists don't know how to organize the things that come out of their mouth? What a, what a weirdly, what a really, really weird position for anyone even remotely left-wing to make. I think artists have a better concept of how to tell meaningful, important, and unique stories than any studio head going to a focus group. Studio heads and focus groups bring us things like the Disney live-action remakes. Artists like the gay musician Howard Ashman gives us the gorgeous songs from Mulan and Beauty and the Beast. Artists create art. Artists have good ideas. Sometimes they do need to be reined in or adjusted different ways, but acting like they're somehow not as capable or more capable than the studio heads that often suck the soul out of their projects is really weird. ...show that aims to be higher art than something like Spongebob, you should be under a large amount of scrutiny because kids are observant people. And if the crop of 90s kids who turn into adults raging about the Thundercats reboot are any indication, what you see in fiction as a child will color your worldview however subtly as an adult. Shows with a teenage or adult audience in mind generally get away with more because the audience is expected to already know better, so the creator has more inherent freedom to make dumb jokes or tell stories about complete monsters. Sugar is making her show for kids, or at least claiming to, so she can't be this irresponsible. But she is this irresponsible, and she just doesn't care. Personally, I would never let a child in my care watch Steven Universe. Ever. In spite of the few moments of brilliance I've seen, this show is simply too recklessly made and is likely to resonate with someone in all the wrong ways. Be who you are, but just as long as you hide at all times. Never try to improve- You're not hiding it at all times! You're showing it to everyone at- You know, I think one of the biggest issues is Lily just doesn't understand the concept of fusion. It's been consistently a talking point for criticism, where for some reason Lily hasn't grasped the concept that whenever a fusion occurs, they become a perfect mixture of the previous two characters. They aren't hiding who they are when they're Garnet. The only person who was fooled was Steven because he doesn't know about gems. Literally every single gem that ever sees Garnet will immediately recognize what they are looking at. Every single gem will immediately realize that is a fusion, and more so that that's an unnatural fusion. Considering that to be hiding at all times is such an unbelievable misunderstanding of the story that I can't believe they got this far into the video and hadn't realized it. As a person, you're already as good as you're ever going to be. Those who have hurt you should get a fourth, fifth, and sixth chance. Those people who have murdered literally millions on multiple occasions deserve to be forgiven. It is totally acceptable to remain on friendly terms with the people who have severely hurt the ones you love. Despite the defense of this being a kid's show, Steven Universe is not a show anybody should be allowing their children to watch. <laughs> I can't believe it, I actually got to the end. I've been working myself to the bone to get this video out, and I'll still have to do a lot more work to eventually get my written video out, although it probably won't be the next video that's out here. If you enjoyed this video, I ask that you please financially support me. I've been completely financially independent for multiple years, and I'm as desperate as I've ever been financially right now. Despite this, I'm still very passionate about what I do and try my best to understand and do things that I think work towards better advocacy. You can become a patron or a channel member, decide to super chat, or donate during one of my streams. Steven Universe is a good show. The narrative that was built around it over the last few years has been exaggerated to an unreasonable realm that has forever tainted it in a lot of people's hearts. But I don't know. Sometimes I think it's alright to like a show about love, empathy, acceptance, where you can learn that no matter what marginalized class you're a part of, that you still deserve to have a happy life, where you get to live free and be your true self. Let me know if you want more, or if there's anything else that you would be interested in me talking about in the future. Once again, this was a ton of work. Thank you for watching. Time for the patron question of the video. If you would like to become a channel member or a patron, you can ask me any question and I might answer it at the end of one of these videos. The question today is from Takutik. Do you ever consider going more deeply into your music creation? Not sure how to formulate it. And maybe even shifting your focus more towards that. That's a great thing to mention. I used to do a lot more music stuff, and I really should do more with it. I mean, I learned guitar for a reason, right? And I mentioned the fact I could play music in my last part. You know what? I always thought I might be bad. Now I'm sure that it's true. Cause I think you're so good. And I'm nothing like you. Look at you go. I just adore you. So special If I could begin
to do something that does right by you I would do about anything I would even learn how to love when I see the way you look shaken by how long it took I could do about anything I would even learn how to love